What was it actually like to be on reality TV? How real or fake was it? Several years ago, my cousin went in for a tattoo at the shop from Inked. You know, the one in Vegas. It was an off filming day, so none of the artists from the show were in. He got his tattoo started, and they asked him to come back in a few weeks when it was healed up to schedule an appointment to finish it. When he showed up, filming for the season was finished. The shop was closed, cleaned out, and the space was for sale. You know, that seems somewhat fraudulent. My dad sued my mum, and they both ended up on Judge Joe Brown because Judge Judy said no. My dad is a scumbag. He dodged child support payments for close to eight years and didn't contact me or my sister during that time, from when I was five to thirteen. When I was thirteen, he popped back up out of the blue and wanted to visit, but he lived in the Ozarks now and we live in New England. So he flies out for a couple of days and we visit, don't really hit it off, and he goes back home. A few months later, we get a letter from some producers in LA saying my dad called the number for Judge Judy and filed a lawsuit against my mum, demanding she reimburse him for the money he spent to visit us. It says Judge Judy turned it down, but they had a new show yet to air called Judge Joe Brown. They wanted my parents to appear on that. If she said no, there was no legal jeopardy for her. The show is for entertainment. It also said my mum could file a countersuit against my dad. So being really angry, she did. For everything from school tuition, to books, to dentist bills, to my sister's speech therapy, food, school supplies, clothes, and fricking everything for eight years. It came out to about 150k. Now, the filming date is scheduled and it happens to fall on my first day of school. My mum decides that's too important a day to miss, so I'm cut from the trip. They fly out, get put up for free in a nice hotel, free meals, spend a while in hair and makeup, then start filming. Within three minutes, the judge boots my sister from the room, saying that a little girl doesn't need to see her parents fight in public. Good guy. The judge listens to both my dad and my mum. My dad's reason for suing was that my mum lived too far away. The judge asks who decided to move to the Ozarks. The judge calls my dad a moron. Judge listens to my mum list off all of the crap my dad skated on. Judge says if he could, he'd give her every dime she asked for, but the limit is 5k and she's getting all of that. The judge tells my dad he should be ashamed. My mum calls my dad a deadbeat on national television, crossing that off her bucket list. Both she and my sister got a bonus $300 appearance fee and cards from a bunch of people who book extras and backgrounds for soap operas and stuff. Then they spent the next day at Universal Studios, the same day as the MTV Movie Awards. So they all got to watch all the limos arrive and some of the red carpet for that. Then on the flight back, they ran into some soap opera actors from General Hospital, which is my mum's favourite. It was a good trip for her. Ha! Huh. You know, I always felt like the people on these law shows were just roundly being exploited, but I'm happy to be proven wrong in this one case. Screw you, author's dad. I was on set for a filming of Ghost Hunters in Buffalo. On the show, they're investigating an upper level of the Buffalo Central Terminal when they hear a disembodied voice say, Get out! It was the property manager on a lower level yelling at some homeless people to clear out. Everyone knew it was him, but it somehow made it into the show as an unexplained event. When my wife and I were looking to buy a home in Michigan, our agent told us we had the opportunity to be on House Hunters if we wanted to. We talked to some person from the show and they told us the basic process. We'd buy whatever home we wanted, then they'd film us there before we moved in, as though we were just looking at the place, as well as two other prospective places that they'd selected. Then we'd ultimately choose the house we'd already bought and live happily ever after. We watched a few episodes, or I did, my wife already liked the show, and I convinced my wife of how stupid they'd probably make us look, so we passed on that. While at a bar in New York City, someone approached my dad and his buddy asking if they wanted to be on a gourmet cooking show. Naturally, they agreed and asked if I, a 14-year-old at the time, could join. The promoter said, of course, gave them the location and told them to tell me not to eat a big lunch as it would be a large multi-course meal at an upscale restaurant. I skipped lunch that day after a rough lunchtime soccer match and left school early to meet my father and his friend. We arrived in a strange part of Manhattan, near the Hudson, in a rather dead part of the city. We got a call from the producer saying, sorry man, wrong location, we're sending a car to pick you up immediately. We hopped into a taxi and boom, you're on cash cab, the bald-headed host declared as lights flashed above our heads. So we lost, got kicked out in Chelsea and ended up spending our own money on food and a taxi home. 
It was very upsetting. I was on this morning when I was about seven, and they did a big makeover for me and my siblings. The premise they created was that we were a nightmare, and my poor mum just wanted us to look smart for an upcoming christening. The main part I remember was them telling us to jump in the mud and shout no when our mum asked us to stop. Normally, we wouldn't have dared, so I remember that being fun. Oh, and my sister ruined her hair three times before going on stage, so they made us hold her hands so she couldn't touch it. I have several friends that were on the first season of Moonshiner on the Discovery Channel. It's totally fake. I mean, they do make moonshine, but what you see on the show is not what it's like in real life. Most of them are licensed to sell alcohol, and do sell it locally at the package stores. The others only make a little to have for themselves and a few friends. More to keep up a family tradition than anything else. But the producers had them set up stills in the woods and even told them what to wear to make it look more like a backwoods, redneck, good old boys thing than anyone in this area has looked in 50 years. Most of us sat there with the guys that were being filmed, watching the episodes and laughing at all the people that probably think this stuff is real, while drinking store-bought beer. The hard stuff is only for rare occasions. It'll rot your gut if you drink it all the time. I worked on Love It or List It. The reactions at the time of the reveal of the house were meant to be real, and they actually signed a contract saying they won't go in the house before renovations are complete. 99% of the work isn't done by the people shown doing the work on TV. It's done by subcontractors. The entire staff works until 1 or 2 a.m. the night before filming to get the house ready. Most of the stuff they put in for design purposes was taken back after the shoot because it wasn't part of the homeowner's budget. We got blacklisted from several stores because we'd buy thousands of dollars of stuff and take it back after we shot. I was on Jerry Springer. The episode never aired, but the entire thing was fake. They even asked me to find friends to complete the storyline of a double love triangle. Coolest part of all of that was when they literally asked me if I wanted a fake doctor's note or a fake death certificate made out in a fake family member's name in order to get me out of work. They literally had a guy on staff whose only job was to get people out of work so they could attend filming. My ex was scheduled to appear on Jerry Springer once. His girlfriend at the time was an exotic dancer, and their show recruiters went to the club she was dancing at to pick up girls for upcoming episodes. She agreed to film and managed to get a deal where my ex would get to appear on the show with her. Behind-the-scenes negotiations involved coming up with a storyline and light scripting. The plot would be that he was appearing on the show to propose to his stripper girlfriend, and she would reveal that she was actually a working girl and would introduce him to her pimp. The showrunners loved it and even agreed to provide an engagement ring for the bit. So he woke up for his morning flight, turned on the TV while he packed, and watched the Twin Towers fall on live TV. September 11th blocked his chance at white trash fame. Well, that was a wild roller coaster of a story. Of course, we all knew that Jerry Springer was more fiction than any given anime, but the story leading up to this guy's cancelled TV appearance is just stranger than any story the writers could have come up with themselves. When I was in university about seven years ago, we got an email inviting us to take part in 60 Minute Makeover in the UK. It's a show where a person's family calls in a team of experts to totally refurnish their house while they're away from home for the day. The audience at home are led to believe that all of the work is done within 60 minutes, and they make a point to start their countdown on camera and rush everyone in to meet the deadline. About 10 of us joined the makeover team at about 8am on the day, and were given flat pack furniture to make outside the house before they started the makeover. The crew had a skip outside where they threw all of this poor unsuspecting guy's furniture, only to be replaced with all of this cheap stuff that was only available to him via sponsorship of the program. They list all of the new furniture's manufacturers in the credits at the end of the show. They also masked off all of the skirting boards and light switches, ready for painting before we were let loose inside. We were let into the house as a member of the ITV crew declared the start of our 60 minutes. After 30 minutes of frantic, patchy wall painting, carrying lamps, uncomfortable seating and chipboard coffee tables into the house, we were told to vacate. We then had lunch in the street while the experts went in to clean up our mess and then did it all again for another strict 30 minutes. After we were finished and the official 60 minutes were over, there was another period of professionals tidying and filling our crappy decorating before we all gathered outside and waited for a man to come home from work. He had found that all of his furniture had been smashed into a skip outside the house and replaced with stuff that may look good on camera for a couple of seconds during a quick sequence but would be very disappointing to live with. 
This man would be very happy about his makeover, and we'd leave the scene as more experienced, well-rounded students with an insight into TV production. My cousin was involved in filming for The Bachelor, not as a contestant, and said that they film many scenes in several different ways. For example, they might film them cuddling while walking, and then walking while looking annoyed, and so on. Not that fake, but yeah. You can submit your own stories to be featured here on the channel. The story submission link is in the description below. And if you want to listen to some vibey music in the background, check out Easy Mode, also linked below, and subscribe. In Holland, there was a Dutch version of Pimp My Ride. A player of a football team we played against had his car pimped, and the car didn't even make it home. He had to call the car repair service on his way back from the studio. My mate was on Tattoo Fixers. If you don't know what it is, basically they get people with tattoos they regret and make a design they don't tell them about, tattoo it on top and cover up the old one, and surprise them at the end. He filmed the big surprise reveal like five times because he wasn't surprised enough. Not me, but my best friend was 16 and pregnant. Now, I don't know if this is always the case, but none of the drama on her episode was fabricated. However, at one point, they did ask her to reenact a conversation that she had with her mother off camera. The funny part is they had her reenact it about a week after giving birth, so she was no longer pregnant. To hide that, she wore a big sweatshirt and held a teddy bear in front of her tummy, so you couldn't tell the difference. My sister's friend's family was on House Hunters several years ago, and everything about it was staged. They'd already decided on the house before the show even started filming, and another two options that the couple was considering were found afterwards. They filmed a bunch of fake conversations between the family members to make it seem like they were still making up their mind. The thing is, this was a Latino family, and every member struggled heavily with English. The conversation scenes were obviously forced, as these people were just stumbling their way through scripted English sequences, and it was obvious that they would have been having conversations in Spanish if they were on their own. The issue was so bad that I'm surprised they even aired the episode. I was on an episode of Wife Swap. One of the wives was a burlesque dancer, so her new husband had to MC a variety show of which she was the headliner. I was the juggler in that act. Full disclosure, I'm pretty sure all tape with me on it is on the cutting room floor. Anyway, it's pretty darn fake. The people are real and a lot of their interactions are real, but a lot of scenarios are staged. Okay, now we're going to plan for the show, but make sure Wally, the new husband, takes over. He had never done anything showbiz before, so naturally we tried to help him, but the director kept telling us that he was in charge and he needed to be doing the planning. I caught a moment of a personal interview as well. Honest answers, but very much being steered by the camera crew and director. During the show, the crew said they needed to get sound levels, so they had people sit quietly, clap politely, clap normally, clap loudly, among others. I'm fairly certain that this was so that they could have clips showing a range of responses. In the end, the whole show bit got about four seconds of screen time. Waste of two days, no pay for us. What the actual fudge? I mean, I knew that these shows were complete bullcrap, but you'd have thought that they'd actually pay the people who they're literally rounding in to do what sounds like legitimate acting, as in doing stuff as commanded by the director that isn't real. So dumb. I was on a European version of Survivor, where we went to an island and had to survive for two weeks. Whatever was seen on camera was what was actually happening. The only fake thing is that we got some food to maintain a somewhat healthy diet. My girlfriend's best mate was on a similar show here in Australia. She said there was a lot of clever editing, obviously, but that the crew fed them plenty of booze and a little bit of food. I actually have three. A friend of mine was on The Bachelor. This was years ago, and she ended up being one of the last four girls. She said they were constantly fed alcohol, were put on a strict sleep schedule where they were literally put to bed and woken up. Also, there were no clocks anywhere, so all the girls were in a constant state of alcohol-fueled disorientation. There were no chance encounters where the guy is just sitting on a couch and the girl goes up to talk to him. All of that is staged. Even their conversations were reshot over and over if their reactions weren't right or if their wording was off. The entire thing was completely controlled, and she said no one really knew the guy because none of their interactions were real. Another friend of mine's house was on House Hunters. He wasn't on the show himself, but his house was the one that was picked. And yes, it was sold and all the paperwork was signed before they filmed. He was there when they filmed all the segments, but wasn't allowed on camera. And my wife was on America's Got Talent. She was a dancer for her friend's act. She said they lived in a tent for four days in the parking lot. She had a very positive experience, though. 
She said she met a lot of cool people and that it did feel genuine for the one episode she was on. Her friend made it through that round but got eliminated the following week. I was on an Australian reality show called Surprise Chef. The premise of the show was that the celebrity chef would meet someone at the supermarket and then cook dinner for them. On my episode, I volunteered at an aquarium. The story in this episode was that the chef met my boss at the supermarket, then cooked all of the aquarium volunteers a nice surprise dinner. Of course, this was all prearranged. There was no meeting by chance. We all knew what was happening, so for the scene, we all got surprised in the shark tank. We knew what was happening and did seven takes of fake surprise. The celebrity chef cooked nothing. He went in for a few takes and an actual chef cooked all of the food while the celebrity stood outside chain smoking. The food was average, basically local RSL quality, chicken palm and profiteroles. I think I drew the short straw of things you get in a reality show, a crappy meal. Other people get like cars or renovation makeovers. My brother was on X Factor UK. There are several rounds before the televised rounds, so all of those rubbish acts you see on TV have been picked by producers to go through. I've also been in the audience of The Voice and X Factor, and they make you do loads of fake cheering, dancing, and clapping before the show starts, so they can cut it into the actual show. 90% of the cheering you see or hear on televised shows has been added in post-production. My dad was on Comic Book Men, basically the same as Porn Shop Stars, but for comics set in New Jersey. He didn't want to sell the item, he just wanted to show it off. It was off-the-cuff dialogue with cast live on camera. He did two takes, there was no script. They did ask him to come up with a reason to sell the item, which was based on truth. I was on set with him as the background. It was pretty cool to be there, but I had to stay in the same place for an hour and a half rereading the same crappy DC comic. They aren't allowed to show any Marvel stuff unless it's an item someone brings into a store. The crew spends about 15 minutes hiding all of the Marvel items in the store before shooting a segment. I loved the experience, though. I was on Stan Lee's Superhumans. Long shoot at the high-altitude chamber I worked at. They brought a guy who had climbed Mount Everest a bunch of times without supplemental oxygen, 29,000 feet, so we brought him to the same altitude in the chamber with some Westerners to compare against. He asked for oxygen after 15 minutes, and after 30, they asked me to pretend to pass out. Looking back at what aired, it's obvious that I was faking, and they edited the show so that he won the competition. It's season 2, and Spider-Man is the episode title. I worked with this guy who was on a TV show in England. He said the show producers would tell him he'd get more airtime if he was cheating on his partner, instead of just being happy with his girlfriend. They just love the drama and don't care what it costs. Yep, that about checks out. At least it sounded like Jerry Springer had the decency to plan the affairs and fake it with the people on the show, so that he wasn't just encouraging people to ruin their real-life relationships as well as their reputations. I was on a TV show in the UK called Bargain Hunt. I went on it for a bit of a drunken dare and never expected to get past the online application form. But after a phone interview and a bargain hunt tryout day, we got on, as in me and my workmate. I asked my workmate as he was going through a crappy time. It was shot over two days. On day one, we had one hour to choose the three antiques to buy, and day two was the auction day, where we sell chosen items. The only fake bit about it was that we had an hour to choose our three items, but we actually spread this over five hours as we had to film, get sound right, get lighting right, among other things. And as the TV crew were sorting out lighting and stuff, me and my friend would keep on looking around the antique house for other objects to buy. A guy didn't ask me anything about being on Pimp My Ride. Everything done to the car was cosmetic. I believe his car didn't run before the show and didn't run after. Basically, a polished turd. I was on a reality ambulance TV show when I was an EMT. The patients were real and their medical conditions were real. Everything else about the show was fake. When we filmed this, it was for a bariatric ambulance TV show. In the morning, when the camera crew got there, they filmed us driving lights and sirens around the parking lot. Then we did personal interviews where they let us talk about moving bariatric patients and how we felt about our jobs. Then they made us say a bunch of stuff that we normally would never say, like, without us, these patients would die among others. They used these clips of the stuff they made us say and spliced it into the real-life stuff we said. Our actual ambulance transport scene in the show was 100% planned and scripted. The patient wanted to go to the ER and have some decubitus ulcers looked at. However, this patient, being diabetic, had a high blood sugar of 400, having just eaten and taken insulin. 
We took that and were forced to treat it like a life or death situation, and then they used our earlier footage of saying things were life and death and our driving around the parking lot lights and sirens to make it seem like we were fighting for her life. In reality, in about 30 minutes her sugar was going to go back down to normal and life would be good. The whole experience actually turned me off reality TV and made me realize how fake everything is. I had a cousin on the new Chris Hansen. I wish that was fake. It's not. My cousin was on Hell's Kitchen and said they'd film for over 10 hours a day, then they'd go to sleep around 11pm only to get woken up at 2am to film again to make them more irritable. The producers would purposely bring up topics to create drama with the chefs, they retaped when they answered the door in the beginning a couple of times to make them seem more surprised, they portrayed my cousin as the classic hot blonde. It was certainly more of a reality TV show than a cooking show. How did you survive your final destination moment? When I was around seven, I almost fell into the septic system in my yard. The access point was opened and I didn't see it until my leg was dangling into a pit of number two. The event scared me so badly that for at least two months, I didn't go into my yard. I was working at Walmart on the maintenance crew overnight. There was a blocked drain near the deli and I had to dump some clog remover into it. No big deal. I walked up and found that someone had jammed a wet floor sign into the drain gate. So I yanked it out, didn't know if the clog remover would bleach it or something, and in pulling out the sign, I also moved the drain cover. I dumped in about a gallon of the stuff, that's what they told me to do, and I figured that was that. I took off my gloves, tossed them into the trash can near me, and then I noticed the grate was shifted. With a lack of sense, because I was a teenager after all, I put my hand into the water and moved the drain back into place. No big deal, I just saved everyone's loose change from falling into the drain. I walked into the back and was doing something else for a bit and kind of noticed my hand was sort of itchy. I have eczema, so being itchy was nothing new. I went on to grab a broom with the hand that I'd put in the drain and the broom stung my hand. I look all over the broom and nothing was sharp, so I took a look at my hand. My hand was turning deep red all over. My nails were deep yellow and floppy, I was covered in red bumps and there was a black patch forming on top of my hand. I thought it was some massive allergic reaction, so I took some Benadryl and went to find the manager. The manager was nowhere to be found. He was an alcoholic who would sleep off hangovers in the meeting room, so I went to a friend of mine that was also on the maintenance team. He screamed. Not the reaction I was hoping for. He damn near dragged me into the bathroom and told me to turn on the faucet and keep my hand under it, so I did. He runs out like he's on a mission, then comes back in with the manager. I chat with the manager for a bit and get sent to the hospital. Apparently, it wasn't an allergic reaction. The doctor told me it was the natural reaction of someone's skin to industrial strength drain cleaner. My skin was developing a massive chemical burn, and if I'd let it go or not noticed it as soon as I did, it could have burned through my skin, into my blood, and laid me out. I fell almost 200 feet off a mountain in Colorado. The narrator would like to note that the individual who submitted this very short story is called Mountain Lover. I do wonder if they created that profile name before or after their life and death moment. I suppose we'll never know. I was around 11 months old at the time and was always a very playful baby. My mum was cooking something up in the kitchen and let me play in my crib. I was very giggly and would make noises, so my mum knew I was okay. However, at a certain point, she stopped hearing me make noises completely, and I previously took a nap so she knew something was wrong. She found me not breathing in the crib and immediately dialed 911 and tried mouth to mouth, but nothing was working. She felt like the ambulance was taking too long, so she picked me up and ran down the stairs of our apartment complex to look for help. Coincidentally, there was a police officer just about to leave, responding from a call, and he noticed my mother bawling her eyes out. The police officer rushed us to the sick kids' hospital here in Toronto, and luckily we lived 10 minutes from the hospital. The ER was able to revive me within 5 minutes. The ER team later told my mum if it was 10 minutes longer, I would have died. It still brings chills when I think about the story. Probably the most frightful thing for any parent to go through. Worked in a 120-year-old building where the elevators were built to be operated by people, not computers. They put in push buttons, but there were always people there working on the elevators. They never seemed to work right over all the years I've worked there. 
I can't remember a time when they weren't trying to fix at least one of the elevators. One day I was riding an elevator down and it suddenly just stopped. Sat there for 10 seconds or so, then it jumped about 3 or 4 feet and instantly dropped about a floor. It then slowed back to normal speed and stopped again. The weird thing was that nobody screamed, nobody talked and nobody made any sounds. We all pretty much just assumed we were about to fall to our deaths. But then there was a weird electric feeling as we just waited to see what would happen. Waiting, not moving, total silence. Instead of plummeting us to our deaths, the elevator then just resumed its normal course to the next floor and opened. I hit a deer while in a VW rabbit. Deer head smashed through the windshield and pushed the glass into within a few inches of my face. Only the layer of plastic designed to keep the windshield together kept it from decapitating me. My face was filled with broken glass, which is really awful because you can't pick it out, and when you try to brush it off, it drives all the little slivers deeper in and they hurt more. I'm convinced I still have glass shards in my face that will remain there forever. In a final act of revenge, the deer spun around and its butt simultaneously busted my back window and left Doody on the rear seat. I got hit in the head with a lawn dart once. It just bounced off. I was 40 years old when I did this. Stupid, I know, but I'm still here to tell you not to do it. I live next to train tracks in the city of Houston. One very foggy winter night, I went for a walk on the train tracks. I heard a distant train and saw the glow of the light. I turned around and started running back towards home. The tracks are lined with tall weeds, meaning that there was no real area to jump off into without getting dirty, scratched and wet. I was going for the break through the weeds, where I got onto the tracks. The train was closer than I thought due to the fog. It was getting louder and the light was brighter. The horn was blaring. I was running and I tripped. I fell flat between the rails. I jumped up, jumped into the weeds and the train shot past, horn screaming. With some presence of mind, I marked the spot where I was with a chunk of wood. I got up after the train passed, went home, got a flashlight and came back to my marked spot. After a bit of searching, I found my glasses in the rocks between the rails. I never told my wife or my boys about my misadventure. I want you to quit tomorrow and look for a job at the library. Books can't kill you. Signed, your concerned mother. As someone who works in the library, I'd beg to differ. The 700 pagers are just murder waiting to happen. I was doing one of those assault course things that we all do as a child. Harness and safety gear on as we all do. I must have been around 11 or 12. Headed up on the rock wall and had to leap onto some sort of pole thing that had a platform on it from the top of the wall. Anyway, I'm on this platform and next I have to head across the monkey bars to finish the course. So I jump across onto the bars when suddenly the harness snapped. I was essentially about 50 feet from the ground and impending death, so I had to get to the end of the monkey bars. Luckily I did and I made it to the bottom unscathed but shaken up. In short, I'm Spider-Man. Also, I'm told that when I was born and flying out of my mother's ladyhood, I was about to fall and land on my head and my dad actually caught me. I cannot confirm whether or not this is true as I can't remember it. So it kind of just seems like the universe just sort of wants this commenter to die by falling from a great height. Take note of this author and don't let me go on a cable car with you anytime soon. When I was 15, my mum was driving me to school, and since it was rather early in the morning, she fell asleep at the wheel for a second. The road in question had no curb, and to make matters worse, it was right beside a salt marsh. Needless to say, water almost up to the bottom of the windows, which we got out of. To make matters even worse, I don't like being wet. It was not a good day. All right, let's talk about my 2011, shall we? First, I was walking to school. Just got a text with some bad news from a friend. Distracted, I looked up and saw a car slowing to a stop at a crosswalk. I did not check to see if she saw me. She did not. As I stepped out, she slammed into me, pushing me into oncoming traffic, and due to perfect timing, she pushed me between two cars as they passed, and I managed to awkwardly dance out of death's way. Much crying on both of our parts ensued. The second event was when I got a moped. It was windy as frick in Hawaii and I'm not experienced at all at moped riding. I was coming home from work and a huge gust of wind caught me off guard. I overcorrected and ended up tipping over while going forward, again almost getting caught under the wheels of an oncoming car. 
Luckily, they stopped right a few inches short, and my moped kept going right into someone's front lawn. Much crying ensued. The third was when my fiancé came over to visit during the Christmas break. It had been very windy for the previous week, and on Christmas Day we were walking around in the military park down by Waikiki. We stopped for a few minutes to look at this plant and exchanged to each other how it looked like the top of an enormous onion. We continued walking and suddenly there was this horrible creaking. I will never forget that sound, this inexorable, monstrous death rattle. We both looked up at the huge tree above us for falling branches. Nope, no falling branches. The entire fricking tree is tipping over directly onto us. I felt my fiancé bolt from my side and immediately followed him. He has better situational awareness, and when I felt him run, I was like, crap, better run too. We could feel the leaves brushing us as we fled. Had we not stopped to look at the plant, we would have been too far under the tree to make it out. A huge branch fell just where we had been standing. The author at this point says that there was much furious effing, but I'm not sure whether they meant they were swearing or doing the deed. So that's up to you, listeners. You can submit your own stories to be featured here on the channel. The story submission link is in the description below. And if you want to listen to some vibey music in the background, check out Easy Mode, also linked below, and subscribe. This didn't happen to me, but it almost killed my best friend. When I was in 8th grade, my buddies and I were messing around after we'd just finished school. We found this enormous exercise ball that was shaped like a large pill. Anyway, it was really fun to dropkick this sucker to each other in the gym while a large amount of small children run around. We were already setting up a good situation, right? Anyway, we were having fun kicking it around and it was my turn to pass it to someone. I grabbed it and kicked the living crap out of it. It sailed high enough to scrape the ceiling of the gym and we were watching the trajectory down when all of a sudden, I spotted my friend who was walking away from me after I'd kicked it. I yelled at him to watch out but it was too late and the ball hit him on the top of the head slightly to the side. I stood in horror as I watched his ear touch his right shoulder, and this was all his neck bending, mind you. His shoulder hadn't moved an inch. Luckily, he didn't die or get paralyzed, and to this day, we're still good friends. And sometimes he says the vertebrae pop in his neck if he bends it too far to that side. I'll preface this story by saying that I'm a triplet and it's more my brother's story than mine. My brothers and I are fairly good skiers, and this year our family went on vacation to Snowbird, Utah to ski. We're able to pretty much handle the entire mountain, including all of the tree skiing and hardest slopes. Well, our parents, who aren't as confident taking risks while skiing, usually let us go off on our own, and we go to do all the crazy stuff that we want. If anyone here knows how it is skiing out west, they'll understand how easy it is to ski down the mountain, out of bounds, and get to areas where you're just like, Crap, there's no way I can get down. So, at the top of the mountain, we see some people who look like pretty nice skiers start out across the mountain through the trees. Of course, our teenage invincibility perspective took over, and we were soon following these people further and further from the trails. Eventually, these people find a reasonably skiable area and head down, but being the idiots we are, we continue on a small narrow path across the mountain. As we got a bit further, we finally come to the realization that, crap, we're screwed, since we can't go back and the only way down was literally the steepest slope, combined with natural obstacles, tree roots, rocks, etc., all ending in a 15 to 25 foot drop off a cliff. My one brother makes it down through a combination of sliding, skidding, and sheer determination not to fall. But to make matters worse, my other brother, before even going down, falls and his boots come out of his skis. This is where the idiot has his near-death experience as he tries to put his skis back on, on this steep, steep slope. At this moment, some really chill dude skis in expertly and goes, Hey, what's good guys, trying to catch some cliff? To which my brother replies sarcastically, That was the plan. Not showing his brightest moment and emboldened by this bro skier, he tries to stomp his left boot back into his ski, causing him to overbalance, and I mean the next part literally, fall head over heels down the mountain. My first reaction was, Oh crap, my brother just freaking died and I'm stuck at the top of this stupid ski slope. Surprisingly, other than some bruises, he seemed to be okay, but this left me at the top with all of his ski stuff to get down. I managed to make it all the way down to the cliff drop, 
bigger than any other I'd attempted previously. By this time, we had a small crowd of spectators in the middle of the trail that the cliff shot out onto. With only this last bit, and in front of this crowd, not wanting to look like a scrub, I propelled myself forward, screaming, for Narnia, and went off the edge. Needless to say, despite my heroic battle cry, I leaned too far forward and did an impromptu front flip, crash landing into a snowbank. Luckily, the snowbank was so soft, so I didn't get hurt, and of course, I tried to play it off as intentional. Unfortunately, this experience only increased our confidence that we would never get hurt, and we continued skiing aggressively for the rest of the vacation. By the way, don't question the Fanania cry, as it was the first thing that came to mind. I think everyone who's gone beyond beginner level of skiing or snowboarding has experienced something that at least seems like a near-death experience before. The narrator, too, has accidentally flown over his fair share of cliffs and emerged miraculously unharmed. When I was going to school out of town, I had about a two-hour commute from home to school. Straight shot on the interstate. I was coming home one weekend for a show and grabbed some fast food for the road. Popped in a CD and enjoyed the ride. About two weeks before this trip, I bought my first car, so I was stoked to drive anywhere. I was about halfway through my ride when I suddenly woke up to the rumble strips on the road. Next thing I know, the car fishtails and flips off the road and on the side of a hill. It lands on the driver's side and I managed to climb out of the car from the passenger window, because the window still worked, and escaped while the car was smoking and completely effed. I laid on the grass until someone stopped by, calling 911, and I went to the hospital. Somehow I walked away with only a few stitches in my arm. Once, my girlfriend asked if I thought a friend of hers was pretty. I said, yes. Oof. A woman decided to text while going 75 to 80 miles per hour on the interstate and almost mowed me down. She then gave me the finger. That's the third time this month I've been in a car that almost got hit because the other driver was messing with their phone. I'm 16 and I got my license last week. I'm a decent driver who doesn't make dangerous decisions, and I don't want to worry about dying the next time I'm on the road because you just had to get that text or email or call out. Unless you're calling 911 because you're dying, put down your freaking phones. Oh, I have two. When I was a kid, my friend pulled out his BB gun, pointed it at my forehead about two inches away, and pulled the trigger. Nothing. Then he pointed it at the ceiling and pulled the trigger again. That time it discharged. I'm not an expert on BB guns, but I think it would have penetrated my skull. Then in college, my girlfriend and I were driving in an unfamiliar city after dark. We were both looking at a map and drifted out onto a red light. We got plowed into by a Ford Super Duty towing a boat going 40 to 50 miles an hour, hitting our front driver's side quarter panel and sending both vehicles on opposite directions. If we'd been going two miles per hour faster, it would have impacted my door and undoubtedly killed me. I was 15 or 16 and went to a pool with my friend. I don't know how to swim and told him over and over again. He said, don't worry, he's actually trained, so he's got me. So my idiot self jumped into the six foot deep end. I was flapping around while he just stood there. I went all the way down and then pushed myself up, slowly moved to a corner and got out. Turns out he didn't know how to swim. When I was 10, we lived beside train tracks, and for some reason, I was allowed to walk on them because the train only came once a day. Great parenting. My friend and I looked behind us one day to see the train coming around the bend. There was nowhere to jump off the tracks because of high rock ledges on each side. I took off running, leaving my friend behind, and made it to a spot just ahead with a drop-off into a rocky ravine. I jumped in and my friend came after. We weren't hurt, but I'll never forget seeing the front of the train directly behind me. I didn't tell my parents until I was about 35. I drowned in a wading pool when I was 12. My neighbor pulled me out, held me upside down to drain the water out of my lungs, and got me breathing again. I don't remember any of it, but my mum told me about it afterwards. I used to work in a computer shop. It was a mum and pop computer store that sold custom-built machines and repaired PCs. Two occasions come to mind. First, I was holding a motherboard in one hand and the power switch for the PC in the other. I pushed the power button with my right thumb and must have been touching some part of it that screamed conductive, because the next thing I knew every muscle in my arms and torso were clenched like it's minus 80 degrees and the motherboard is smoking. Some sort of fuse must have popped somewhere because as quick as it happened, it was over and nothing worked anymore. 
To this day, when I smell burning electronics, my chest twinges. Second, much like the first, only this time involving a faulty power strip. I have my left hand over the center of the strip as I'm unplugging something with my right. Next thing I know, the center of my left hand feels like the solar side of Mercury on a summer's day, and my right hand no longer wants to cooperate with commands. Again, bless you fuses, because I am able to forcibly eject the offending power strip across the room with nothing more than an utterance of obscenities. While writing this, remembering a third time where, as a child, I had a chain much like those used to attach pens to desks, inside banks, except each little bearing was three times larger. I was possessed with the notion that lowering one end of it into the open socket of a plugged-in lamp might be a good idea. Fortunately, I let go of the chain at the last moment and just let it drop. The entire length of the chain lit up in a blue that can only be described as an electric blue, but still is not given homage by the most detailed video game. In that briefest of moments, I smelled the universe. Creation itself was laid bare for my olfactory senses. If you can get high off ozone, I did it that night. The fact that it shorted out half the house and I had to explain to my dad what happened was a minor after-effect in my memory. It would seem electricity is my arch-nemesis. I've had two cars die to the point of needing replacement due to severe electrical problems. If electricity is my mutant power now, I fear I'm doing it terribly wrong. What cringe moment did you catch on camera at a wedding? The father of the groom was making his speech and got to a touching part about his wife, mother of the groom who had passed away recently. I was filming from the back, but I got his sound okay. The thing is, there was a bunch of little kids near me playing quietly until one of them yelled, God damn it, frick you! Right as the father was tearing up. Nobody seemed to notice, but it was plain as day on the tape, so I had to do a lot of delicate chopping on that one. My great uncle took over filming at the reception of my parents' wedding, and halfway through it, it cuts to inside of the kitchen, where he's filming and hitting on the waitress getting the cake ready. It's both of my parents' favorite moment of the tape. When my brother got married, I was one of the bridesmaids. It was a super fun wedding, but my sister-in-law, the bride, got tanked during the reception. She threw up in the bathroom at one point. During the part where the bride throws the bouquet, we had to get her up there, hand her the flowers, and just tell her to throw. So I'm in the crowd to catch it, and I'm pretty tall for a girl at 5 foot 10, so I was the tallest there. She drunkenly throws it, and it beelines to my face. Of course, the bouquet was made of succulents. I had cuts under my eye for about a week, and my cousin had the entire thing on camera from a side angle. It looks like a comedy sketch. Also, I didn't get the bouquet because I was too preoccupied with getting hit in the face. My aunt had a camera floating around for anyone to use at her wedding. While my dad was filming, one of the bridesmaids spilled a bottle of red wine on the center table of the room. It knocked a bunch of stuff off the table as well as making the white tablecloth red. Well, my father was facing the wrong way, so when you watch the video, there's a crashing sound, then my father spins around and says very clearly, Freaking crap, I missed it, as the bridesmaid is scrambling to stop the chaos. Funniest part of the video by far. Oh, my clip was from my own wedding. We got married in a dear friend's front garden I'd helped put together as a teenager. Just as we got to the vows, you can hear people sniffling, just about to cry, when the telltale sound of an ice cream van starts to build. It gets louder and louder until it abruptly stops. The driver obviously noticed what they were approaching and shut off the music at what was essentially the property line to the next door neighbor. Silence as they crept by the house. Then, as soon as they hit the next house, full blast again. The Do Your Ears Hang Low tune. Everyone burst out laughing. They should have come by ten minutes later. They would have made a lot of money. That is the most alternately considerate and inconsiderate ice cream driver I've ever heard of. Honestly, if it wasn't the reception, I can't think of any wedding I've been to that wouldn't have benefited from an ice cream truck right after the service. You know, when you're waiting for the bride and groom to get their first photos in. My sister-in-law was trying to use the wedding photographer as a personal photographer or something to take photos of her family. She's denied this for four months until we all watched the video from the videographer that caught her literally saying, The bride said that she wants you to take the pictures of our families. So the photographer missed a good 20 minutes of the reception to take pictures of her and her family and then came to us and was like, Hey, we didn't discuss this, and tells me what the sister-in-law said. I went to her and she denied it all and said, Oh, the photographer told us that she wanted to take pictures of the family members. Although it was only her and her family, 
which we weren't on good terms with anyway, they weren't even invited. So months later, we were sitting around watching footage, and just like a scene from The Office, you see and hear with perfect clarity, Oh, the bride wants you to take pictures of the families, not the reception. We're ready when you are. And the sister-in-law was sitting in the corner of the room and stomped her way to the door and slammed it as she left. A number of years ago, in my early twenties, I went to my cousin's wedding. My father asked me to dance, and it was going quite well until he asked to dip me. I said no, I was pretty big at the time and figured he couldn't support my weight and would drop me. He was rather disappointed and the dance ended soon after. About three dances later, I hear him calling my name across the dance floor. I look up and he's gleefully dancing with my mother and shouts, Hey Bethany, this is how you dip someone, and promptly dips my mother and drops her straight onto the floor. All proudly caught on video and still referenced at every family wedding to this day. I've filmed dozens of weddings, I put a wireless mic on the groom in a lot of cases, so I get everything he mutters before, during, and after the ceremony. Most of my cussing was audio-related. Lots of guys' buddies telling them they have a chance to run, serious or not. My favorite, though, was walking down the aisle after the ceremony, and the groom whispers to the bride, We're getting it on as soon as we leave this church. And the bride gave him this hilarious look, and they were basically jogging out of the church. And everything the guests filmed on the video guestbook was delivered, good or bad. Definitely had a drunk aunt go on a 15-minute tirade once, and lots of raunchy stories from drunk friends of the bride and groom, but nothing that stands out as too WTF. We made the mistake of deciding to set ours up ourselves on a tripod in the rear of the chapel, and just letting it roll. The plan would have been brilliant if not for the fact that it got bumped when someone walked past and was instead filming a nice, solid shot of one of the uncles fighting a particularly stubborn wedgie for… for way too long. He turns up plastered to anything from a christening to Christmas carols. Luckily, an aunt helped fix the camera. She noticed it and adjusted it eventually. Filming the father of the bride speech, he mumbled his way through it, and the guest in front of me said, Well, that was frickin' crap and only then remembered I was behind him filming and sheepishly looked around into the camera. At a friend's wedding, the videographer was filming a beautiful moment where the bride, bride's sister, brother, and mother were dancing together. Near the end of the dance, her father came and stood behind the videographer and said, This would be a beautiful picture if that B-word wasn't in it. Him and the bride's mother weren't on the best of terms after their divorce. Not me, but my buddy was the videographer for a wedding. During the ceremony, they had candles lining the aisle, and the mother of the bride decided to get closer so she could get a better picture. While she was taking photos, she started walking backwards. Well, she walked backwards right into one of the candle holders and knocked it over right into someone's lap. Commence chaos. The guy jumps up trying to put out the fire that's now in his lap, and his wife starts screaming at the women. Took about 20 minutes to get everything calmed down, and the marriage went off without a hitch afterwards. And yes, it was all caught on camera. The bride insisted it be cut out of the final video, so my buddy put it on a separate tape for us all to laugh at later. My husband filmed at my sister's wedding, and we got a lovely shot of a page boy taking a tinkle in the bushes during the outdoor photos. My cousin is a professional videographer and he did my wedding. I don't think he cut any of the audio because there's definitely a conversation about my husband and father going on a substance raid with some dogs after the wedding. FYI, they're both accountants and neither of them has a dog. One unforeseen side effect of having my husband mic'd up like that is that you can hear every conversation we had in our receiving line. I really love that part because a whole bunch of people died shortly after our wedding and that was the last we saw of them. What? That was a right turn that the narrator wasn't expecting, and it leaves so many questions. Were they all old and died of natural causes? Did the hotel most of the guests were staying at burn down? Sorry, I know it's not funny, but wow, was the food undercooked? I guess we'll never know. Vaguely related, my aunt did the whole disposable cameras on tables thing, along with a professional team, and she got quite a few pictures of gentlemen's downstairs areas. We had a teenage creeper use our disposable cameras. He was taking stalker-like photos of these three teenage girls. We had several cameras worth of these girls, from afar and never looking at the photographer. I don't even know why he did it. He was never going to keep the pictures. 
We did this about 15 years ago at our wedding. Most of the cameras came back with fun shots, but the most memorable one was one that lovingly documented every inch of a fire extinguisher near one of the tables. Like, they set up shots with dramatic lighting, came at it from skewed angles, and must have done a full photo shoot. I don't know where these pictures are now. They reflected dedication to an apparently otherwise unsung hero of weddings. At my brother's, they specified no Johnsons on their disposable cameras, and they got an entire camera full of women's bare chests instead. The funniest thing to get caught on camera during a wedding. We were in Jamaica, and a couple was getting married on a crowded resort beach. A large drunk guy waded into the water and went directly behind the bride and groom, like ten feet back. He keeps trying to get onto one of those floating things anchored in the water and falling off again and again. The guests and people around are just watching this guy try to hold his drink, falling all over the place, floating around. It was hilarious and really embarrassing to watch. When we were at my cousin's wedding, my mother fell a total of three times. All three times, my dad, me, or one of the other two siblings weren't around, so we didn't really believe she kept tripping over her dress. That was until the last day when she had a bruise the size of Eurasia on her tie. We were left scratching our heads like, how? And then the video for the wedding came out, along with the bloopers. In the bloopers, you can see my mother hopping around with her friend and doing bad Irish dancing when she lands, catches the hem of her dress, skids and falls backwards over said friend before baiting herself off the floor. Through the tears, I felt kind of bad for her. You can submit your own stories to be featured here on the channel. The story submission link is in the description below. And if you want to listen to some vibey music in the background, check out Easy Mode, also linked below, and subscribe. Happened to my parents at their wedding and didn't get removed from the video. When they got out of their limo, some kid on a bike came up to them and yelled, Get the frick out of here, you don't belong here. The kid must have been only seven or eight and the wedding was in my mum's hometown. Huh. <laughs> I don't think we took ours out of the video because it was so funny. A Catholic wedding, drinking of the wine at communion. There was quite a bit of wine left after everyone went though. Most times I've seen the priest just finish it off. For some reason, this guy wants the parishioners to finish it. But everyone is having a hard time figuring out what he wants. He wants everyone to go through again and nobody gets it. My brother reaches over, takes the chalice and pounds the remaining wine. Lays it back on the altar. My mum filmed weddings for a long time. Once, the groom was so drunk he could barely dance with his new wife. He was stumbling around, groping his new wife, and even grabbing her butt and thrusting. Super inappropriate bride and groom dance. The bride was so embarrassed. She was just trying to settle him down with no success. This was obviously in front of all the family and guests. My mum made me watch as a lesson in self-control, respect, and humiliation. Mine was my wedding, and we didn't have it removed, nor would we have, but the camera didn't pick up the audio. So when you look at the video, you see us making our vows, then the whole wedding party laughing, and then it continues. What happened was the ring bearer, a little boy of three or four, during the vows where I'm asked, Do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? And this kid says, not quietly, You mean he doesn't have to marry her? It just blew his mind that a guy would willingly marry a girl. I used to videotape weddings for a few years. The funniest thing I saw was during a dollar dance, like the honeymoon dance, and a guest went to dance with the bride, gave her a $20 bill, and asked for change. At another wedding, they had little bottles of bubbles instead of rice so that guests could blow bubbles on the couple as they left the church. One boy, about 10, would take a mouthful of bubbles and blow it out instead of using the little dipper. He made better bubbles than anyone. My dad used to videotape and photograph weddings when I was a kid, including my cousin's wedding. My cousin and I have an age gap. I was three at his wedding. My dad was photographing things and my mom was acting as his assistant, and no one was watching me. So, naturally, I found my way to the pretty, pretty cake, and very uncharacteristically of me, even as a small child, I walked right up and swiped a fistful of it before it was cut. My mum was frantically trying to cover it up when my cousin saw, and he was a good sport about it. Didn't really matter in the end anyway, my cousin was a marine at the time, and one of his superiors was the one to cut the cake. He sliced it in half with a broadsword. No one cared about my sideswipe in the end.
This does beg the question of whether this last guy was meant to cut the cake with his sword or not. It's kind of left open as to whether this was a spur-of-the-moment thing. Maybe he got really blotto and decided to vanquish this tiny rival bride and groom for them. My dad makes these videos. The fashion for ludicrous choreographed dances was at its height. The bride had forced her reluctant groom to dance classes, dancing to I've had the time of my life. So, their big moment arrived, and the room collapsed into laughter. The first two verses were just them facing each other about six feet apart, swaying and clicking their fingers. As the song reaches its climax, she was supposed to run and leap into his arms. They didn't get that far. The bride ran off in tears. My dad had to calm her down and then make an announcement to the room that they must let them have their moment. They did the dance again, and nobody spoke of it afterwards. My dad is into photography as a hobby. He has a bunch of expensive cameras and loves shooting in all kinds of settings, so he volunteered to be a photographer at one of his co-workers' weddings. They had an actual professional photographer there as well, but decided to let my dad get in on the action since he takes a damn good photo. He was snapping random shots all night and took a nice photo of the bride and groom dancing with some other couples. There were tables in the background of the photo and people eating on said tables. There, in the far back center, was a man and a woman sitting at one of the tables. In the woman's hand was the man's Johnson. I guess she thought she'd be able to service him while everyone else was distracted with alcohol and dancing. Both of them have straight faces and you couldn't tell that anything was going on. There were background characters in the shot, so it wasn't noticeable if you weren't looking for it. My dad caught this when he was editing the photos and decided to just darken the backgrounds in a way that you couldn't see this guy's junk in his wife and girlfriend or random drunk woman's hand. He didn't delete it because it was a really good photo of the bride and groom and he really wanted to send it to his co-worker. He never told the co-worker about the whole eggplant part and I believe the couple has the photo in their collection of framed wedding photos. So I was actually the photographer and a buddy of mine was doing video, so this is a bit secondhand. We're standing with the groom at the end of a long walkway, getting ready to do their first look. We're bantering at this point, talking about our dogs and life and whatnot, when we hear a faint but distinct moan. You see, we were standing in the hotel's garden and there were rooms all around us. A U-shaped hotel, basically, and some couple on the left side of the U was having themselves a grand time. Anyway, we chuckled a bit and I asked my buddy, um, you're not going to have any of this audio in there, right? And my buddy laughs and says, well, not anymore. Just then, the bride enters the garden from the base of the U. So we're supposed to capture this super romantic moment. Meanwhile, two people are going at it like it might be their last opportunity to do so. The woman sounded like she was enjoying herself because each moan got progressively louder. We figured they had to be closer to the tip of the U because the bride didn't seem to notice as she approached. Thankfully, the noise stopped when she made it to the groom, and they had their cute little moment uninterrupted. Fast forward a few months, and they're coming into the studio to pick up their video. They watch the quick cut and are very pleased, but then the bride asks us a question we didn't expect. Hey, did you guys get any audio from that couple having loud whoopee? Of course she heard it. How couldn't she? None of us knew she was aware of it because she had played it off so perfectly. Probably for the sake of the video. My buddy went to his editing station and quickly threw together a version of their first look with the original audio, complete with a ding counter for each audible moan. They watched it, laughed hysterically, and thanked us for keeping it. So while it was removed from the cutesy version of the video, the couple was really glad to have it to keep in their personal funny cut. Honestly, good on them for enjoying the memory. I know a lot of bride and groomzillas who would let something like that ruin the memory of the entire day for them. Personally, I would have found it hilarious. Used to be a video guy in the 80s and 90s. Shot probably around 500 weddings, I'd guess, so there were lots of things that had to be edited out. Some of the more memorable ones were the time the brother of the groom stripped completely undressed on the dance floor in full view of everyone, the time when giving a congratulatory interview on camera, the very drunk bridesmaid started deep-throating the microphone, Many, many wardrobe malfunctions, like you'd be surprised at how often chests pop out of dresses, especially during the bouquet toss. Several fist fights and pushing and screaming matches. The mother of the bride screaming at the best man during his toast. In this case, she was furious about something. She wound up walking up to him and spitting in his face. So that was fun. The time the groomsman wrote, I'm screwed on the bottom of the groom shoes with a white marker or something. 
Every time he kneeled down in church, the whole place could see it. The father of the groom having a heart attack on the dance floor at the reception. A woman at another reception slicing her foot wide open on some broken glass. Blood spurting everywhere, getting all over the bride's dress as well and the table that held the wedding cake collapsing when they were cutting it. It fell all over the bride and groom. The bride was hysterically crying. And there were more, believe me. In my wife and I's wedding video, we were watching it a few weeks post-wedding. And out of nowhere, there's this guy I've never seen before, just standing there, holding up a greeting card with an undressed male model on it, with his eggplant fully exposed. We were both watching the video like, what the frick is this crap? And when we pressed him, he said the mother of the bride's friend wanted to hold up the card for the camera and kept pestering him about it. The cameraman didn't want any part of it, but my mother-in-law told him to go along anyway. So yeah, there's full frontal undressed male in my wedding video. It was 2005 and it was in VHS. Too much hassle to remove. I didn't really care all that much. Who watches their wedding video more than a couple of times anyway? I wasn't a videographer, but was a DJ. My partner and I had set up the equipment and done our tests. When the wedding party and guests arrived, we did our final mic checks to make sure everything would be ready for the first dance. When we checked the wireless mic, I noticed there was a lot of static in it, so I asked my partner to walk around the venue while talking into the mic to see if I could get any idea what was going on. I put the microphone into cue and put on a pair of headphones to listen as he walked around. He started by saying test, 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 and then he would walk by a guy and go ball bag, ball bag, ball bag, and then go by a woman and say chest, 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 and pretty soon he was just walking around the banquet hall saying ball bag, ball bag, chest, ball bag, chest, chest. He does this around the entire perimeter of the facility until he gets back to me. When he got back, I told him that there was too much static and we would just need to switch to the wired mic. Once we got things switched over, I decided to work on the wireless a little more, so I turned off the transmitter and just listened to the static from the receiver. After 30 seconds or so, I started to pick out voices and thought to myself, oh crap, and I started looking around and sure enough, there's the videographer talking to his partner and their mouths match up with the voices I'm hearing. Turns out, his wireless mic was on the same frequency as ours, so my partner possibly caused chest, chest, ball bag, ball bag, to be recorded on this couple's tape of their cherished memories. What's your I'm not even supposed to be here today story? When I was in middle school, my mum went to work before I woke up, so I always got myself to school alone. On this particular rainy, windy day, I decided to accidentally sleep in till 11am. I lived in northern Colorado where there are hardly any tornadoes, but when I turned on the TV, there was a serious tornado warning for my exact area. We lived in a tiny apartment on the third floor, and all of the neighbors were kinda sketchy. So I was alone and panicking, just wishing I'd gone to school. By then, the weather was too severe to walk the mile to my school, so I hid in the bathroom and accepted my fate, and eventually the weather cleared up. Missed my flight off Kauai and got on the next flight to Oahu. Flight was 20 minutes. Takeoff was fine and we were ascending normally, until the plane jolted with such severity as I rose out of my seat, I saw a flight attendant hit their head on the ceiling. People started screaming. The plane was tossed up and down and whipped side to side. I grabbed the arms to my chair like it was a jetpack and held on for dear life. This continued for whole minutes. All I could think was, this is how I die. I'm not even supposed to be on this flight. What a terrible way to end this vacation. Eventually it stopped and the pilot came on over intercom and apologized for the turbulence and told us that the drink service would be suspended. I don't care about juice at this point, buddy. Get this plane on the fricking ground. Working in a thrift store, covering another manager's shift so she could take her birthday off. Right after I clock in, I see a woman stuffing her purse with used bras and undies and then try to make a run for the front door. I got as far as saying, excuse me ma'am, before she screams and upends her extra large Taco Bell cup full of Mountain Dew live wire over my head. She runs into the street and everyone in the store stares at me while I'm dripping in orange bullcrap. I got to work the next eight hours with sticky, citrus-scented hair. Worked in fast food. Anyways, this one night it was crazy busy and some people had called in. Here I am wanting to check my schedule, but I noticed the massive lines. 
The one really super chill manager looks at me and motions for me to come to the back and tells me if any of the other managers caught me I would be stuck here all night. It was Friday night and I just wanted to go out and drink. So she literally grabbed me by the collar and dragged me out the back door and closed it behind me. Best boss ever. Nice. Yep, if that was my teenage job at McDonald's, that would be me hauled behind the counter, given an extra shirt, and stuck for the next five hours. Lucky you. Also, your boss is very different to literally every other fast food manager in the world, so congrats on that. Not me, but as I'm getting dressed for work as a paramedic, a co-worker messages to ask if we can switch stations. I was station A and he was station B. In my mind, the stations were about the same, but people usually prefer station A. I say, that's fine, and I go to station B. I proceed to get zero calls. He was busy the entire shift, including a guy that went into cardiac arrest while driving, and hit another car and a tree, and the initial dispatch reported the passenger as being unconscious as well. I heard it all on the radio. He texted me later in the night like, I'm never swapping with you again. In short, co-worker tried to swap for the better station and got screwed. Supposed to be on our honeymoon, but didn't have enough money to go anywhere, so we were hiding from family for the week. Been kinda nice. Came in on my day off because someone called out. Got rewarded with the hands down worst bite in my five years as a groomer. Four deep punctures, two ended up abscessing and I got a bone infection despite immediate treatment and antibiotics. The constant bandage changes ended up ripping bits off my skin, so I have scars, not just from the bite, but also the bandaging. Everyone who says, but all you do is play with puppies all day, to a groomer is full of crap. Reluctantly was taking a trip to Hartford, Connecticut one weekend, and on the way caught a flat tire. A friend drives a Lexus, which requires a custom key to remove the tire. I didn't have the key and had to be towed to an auto shop to have the wheel busted off. The whole process took about two and a half hours, and we were hungry and cranky, so we decided to stop off at a random bar we saw on Yelp, and we head straight there. I walk in, and the owner is crazy excited, like running around the bar excited to see us. He insists we sit at the bar with him, and he tells us we're his first lunch customers ever. Serves us amazing food. We stay for a while for some drinks with him, and we have a good time. Later, a few girls walk in, and he's only slightly less excited to see them. This dude had crazy energy. Have a good time for the rest of the night there, and end up dating one of the girls we met that night for three or four months. Really an enjoyable time. The bar was called the Clydesdale Pub. Not actually in Hartford, but it's close in Port Chester, New York. Definitely recommend checking it out if you're in the area. He was serving what he called Brazilian dumplings at the time that were just amazing. I was almost sold into a working girl ring as an infant. I was born in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where my biological parents basically listed me on the black market, intending to sell me for profit. Much to my fortune, a group that posed as buyers on the black market but was actually an adoption agency, or at least worked closely with one, arranged to buy me, then proceeded to literally steal me in a van and spirit me away to Rio. There I was kept safe, and at nine months of age, a wonderful young couple from Pennsylvania flew down to meet me and take me home forever. I'm now living a fantastic life that was gifted to me against unimaginable odds, and I'm thankful for it every day. And I'm thankful to those who made it possible, whoever they may be. They must have had hearts of gold and boundless courage to enter dangerous situations like that to help the helpless and innocent children like myself. Co-worker's granddad died. I was supposed to be on holiday, but ended up covering her shift. I got there and was informed I needed to fire someone. Well, not exactly. They weren't on high enough warnings yet, so I had to convince her to quit. As a note, I'd properly fired her boyfriend two months prior for an unrelated reason. After that was done, an ex-staff member sent me a crapload of annoyed messages that they hadn't gotten the leaving card or gift. I explained that A, they'd given away their last shifts, meaning that we didn't have time to organize anything, and B, it's never been one of my jobs to organize leaving cards or gifts. There were two other people assigned to the job. Finally, I'd bought another coworker a leaving gift with my own money on my own time, which had nothing to do with work. Also, a kid chucked up. Everywhere. 11 hour shift in my holiday time, never again. Not my story, but a classmate's. My friend got a baby duck, so she went to go see it. Her friend lived with substance dealers. Cops raided the place, and she was arrested along with the 12 guys that were in the house. They all would have been charged with felonies, 
if the two substance dealers hadn't written their names on the bags of green herb. The best part of this story was that the raid happened on the 20th of April. I love college towns. She was still charged with a misdemeanor for possession, by the way, but she kind of got off light. The narrator hopes that the last part only happened because she actually had a bag of the wacky tobacco on her, and not just because she happened to live in the same place. Who knows, though, I guess. Georgia State Penitentiary Was hospitalized over my court date. Social workers took care of it, supposedly. I got back to work at the Air Force, and I had a bench warrant out for me. It told me to show up at Georgia State Pen at 5am. I thought I was getting a new court date. Nope. I got a roommate in cell block D. Didn't get to talk to a lawyer until the next day. After a brief conversation, I was released by the warden. And that's how I learned not to drive like an idiot. But at least I can say I've been to prison. Not on my record, luckily. I got fired while on paid vacation leave to spend the weekend celebrating my 21st birthday. I got home from the bar at around 3am. Woke up at 4am because my phone is ringing. Conversation went like this. Mm, hello? Mr. Drunkman, it's your boss. We need you to come in at 6 to help open. No one else will do it. Boss, I just got home from the bar. I'm still drunk. Just until 9. We just need you until 9. I'm drunk. It's my birthday weekend. I asked off months ago. But no one else will come in. I'm drunk and on vacation. Please, drunk man, please. Oh my god, for frick's sake. Just till 9? Just until 9. Fine, I'll get up and take a shower and call a cab. Thank you. See you at 6. I opened the bakery department and as an added surprise, the coffee bar, which I wasn't trained to do, and I worked both departments alone for two hours serving customers. 9am rolls around and the boss calls me into the back office as I'm clocking out and fires me on the spot for being at work smelling like vodka and asks me to clean out my locker. Looking back, I was supposed to get my annual raise four days later and she knew I'd be drunk. She set me up to work three hours so she didn't have to give me a raise. I was working retail and had two weeks left until school started again, and I was quitting. This lady let her kid go number two on the floor in a clothing rack. My manager approached me and told me the situation and said I was to clean it up. I responded with, I have four days left here, I'll quit right now. You don't pay me enough for that. She laughed and said she had figured I'd say something like that. Then we both laughed. Then she said she'd find someone who actually needed the job to do it. I'm a teacher. I was sick and thought I could make it through a school day, but I was miserable. I went to the office to arrange a sub. On the way back to my room to get my car keys, I saw two students loitering outside the library. I tried to keep my head down and my ears closed, but as I walked by, one said to the other, Man, I'm gonna frickin' murder that kid with his pencil when I see him. He could have just said anything else and I'd have kept walking. Alas. You can submit your own stories to be featured here on the channel. The story submission link is in the description below. And if you want to listen to some vibey music in the background, check out Easy Mode, also linked below, and subscribe. I stopped by a friend's house. It turns out that was the day the police decided to come and arrest him and search his house. I was on my way out the door when they arrived. I was in the Coast Guard and I had to cover for someone on my day off. Well, the night before was my friend's last day, so we threw down and partied. Normally, when you stand by for someone, it's common courtesy from the other crew to basically give you the day off, unless you're really needed. So I said, screw it. Well, I was hung over on the wreck desk, trying not to die, and a pipe goes through that a body had been reported, and they called the crew to make preps and put me on there. The absolute jerks. It turned out to be four bloated bodies that had been gotten to by sharks and other fish. Worst smell I've ever smelled. Got back to the station and had to throw away the uniform I was wearing. That sucked, but not as much as CISM afterwards. That's basically when they sit you down with a chaplain and make you talk about what you've just witnessed immediately after you've witnessed said thing with little to no time to process. It supposedly helps, but it for damn sure didn't help me. Last summer, there was this rugby tournament in my hometown. Since I play rugby while at college and my team is participating, I decide to go visit and watch the games. I originally had been unavailable, which is why I wasn't signed up. Anyways, it's a sevens tournament, but they have an injured player after the first game and are down to six for the next one. So in order to keep playing, they need another player. They watch me on the sidelines and ask me to play. So you remember that my intention was to come and watch some rugby? Well, too bad. Now I'm borrowing someone's cleats and mouth guard to play rugby in jeans. Jeans. Despite that, though, we still played really well. 
I was working night security at a hotel at the time. My co-worker and relief got bit by a spider and had necrosis, so I was called in while he was rushed to the ER. An hour into my shift, the entire half of the town lost power, including the hotel. It was in the middle of summer in 100 degrees plus Fahrenheit, and at night it reached the upper 80 degrees if you were lucky. The hotel was 100% full and the parking lot was pitch black. During this time, some dudes on bikes decided to come around and try to break into some cars. I had to chase them off and one of them got brave and tried to fight me and I had to tase him. His friends carried him off. I walked circles around the hotel for five hours before power came back. I wasn't even supposed to be there that week. You know, it seems to the narrator like this story can only have come from Australia. There are just too many little telltale signs there, starting with the venomous spider bite. Why do you all live down there? I got called into work one day back when I was working customer service. The girl that had been working that day was in a car crash on the way into work, so I wasn't upset about coming in, just worried for her. Anyway, not five minutes after I arrived and clocked in, a lady who looked homeless and absolutely reeked of body odor came in. I worked at a members-only wholesale store, so you had to pay 45 bucks flat fee before you could purchase a single item from the store. This lady came in, wandered around for a minute or two, and then made her way to the counter. Thus started the most bizarre exchange I think I've ever had at a retail store. She said, Do you sell animals? No, this is a wholesale store. Y'all don't sell chickens? What about just chicks? Nope, neither of those. We do sell eggs, but they're unfertilized. Hmm. Well, do you sell cabbage and hot dogs? You bet. Do you have a membership? I'll be glad to set you up and get you ready to shop. Oh no, I couldn't possibly. I gotta save my bucks for chickens and hot dogs. Can't have one without the other, or the cabbage. I'll try Walmart, I guess. You think they have chickens there? They probably do. I'll go there and... and and she ambled away while still talking, clearly no longer talking to me, and left the store. I'll never forget you, crazy lady, and the way you had lipstick smeared all around your mouth. Also, the girl who got in a wreck was fine, but received a broken arm and a new car from the other driver's insurance for her trouble. I had one, very recently in fact. I was at work, doing very little, like full screen games a little, and my boss walked up to us. He asked if I could go and cover the IT help desk as someone had gone home sick. It's not my job, I'm a server admin, but I'm still in internal IT and couldn't really say no because I was playing games at work. Oh gosh, the amount of grief I got from people. My whole day was spent saying, I don't know how to do that, I'm not even supposed to be here today. Most people were fine, a few thought I was new, but there were some real jerks. I don't know how those help desk guys do it. It's hard work and you meet some real idiots, even though it's a huge IT company. This is long, but bear with me. I offered to cover on a day I don't normally work, so my co work could spend some time with her family across the state. It was also the day we were training a new girl. I walk in and one of the other co-workers there starts filling me in on the day before. Apparently, the new hire was all over the map and kept going to the bathroom for 20 or 30 minutes at a time, multiple times over a six-hour shift. It was a doctor's office and we opened for the day. Half day, so opening at one. And she's not here. Not exactly the best impression when you're still training. Half an hour goes by and she says she's walking there and starts rambling. She lives literally a block and a half from the office, so I don't know what she's talking about. My coworker pulls her aside and said she can't keep taking super long breaks unless she has medical problems or stomach issues. She gets it, completely understands, and apologizes. Then she takes off her blazer and reveals the worst outfit I've ever seen for work. It was a romper that somehow showed off her butt and her chest at the same time, whilst also looking dirty like she found it on the floor. She's talking like crazy and can't be quiet or focus on anything. Highlights during the few hours she was there. She stroked a patient's butt cheek and thigh because she wanted to see if her leggings felt as soft as they looked. She flirted with a man that was 70 and married, and when he didn't respond physically, she grabbed him and tried to force herself on him. She said she needed to get something from her boyfriend real quick, parked in our back lot for 30 minutes where no one could see her. When she came back from her parking lot escapades, her entire personality was mellow and dropping until she just stopped functioning. She just stared catatonically at the computer screen for 40 minutes while we discussed what to do about her. We ended up making an excuse and having the doctors tell her to leave. As she left, she went to say goodbye to one of the doctors and was slurring her words and for some reason, at 5.30 in the evening, told him, bye, have good mornings, and then left. 
She then called me multiple times at the office, sobbing because she was fired. It was uncomfortable, and I wasn't even supposed to be the one working that day. In short, filled in and ended up training a girl who was high out of her mind. Did not have good mornings after that. Well, in my manager and team leader roles, I've witnessed some pretty disastrous first days in my time, but never any as bad as this. What substance do we think she was on? Smack? That poor girl needs help in any case. I used to make custom leather accessories for motorcycles and once worked on a Saturday to catch up on special orders. A couple came in for a tank bra for the wife's bike. Turns out I knew the husband for years and the new wife was the CPA for a development company looking for an assistant. And that's how I'm not even supposed to be here today turned into a much better paying job about 10 minutes away from home with excellent benefits. I was visiting federal prison for a community event and after it was over, there was time to visit with the inmates. Well, me and a friend were about to leave to go and get lunch, but since my co-worker was there, I thought to invite her. She was all the way in the back of the room, but before we could make ourselves back to the door, there was a lockdown. We were stuck there, hungry and without any news, for over two hours. After we got out, I heard in the news that an inmate had escaped. In short, I was in a lockdown in a federal prison because I thought to invite my co-worker to lunch. Worked at McDonald's in high school. A manager called me and asked me to work a breakfast shift on Saturday morning. I figured, sure, the manager was pretty cool and I'd be out of there in a few hours. They have me taking orders and money at the back drive through window. Car pulled up and it was this old lady. We had the strangest conversation I've had at that place and it went, Welcome to McDonald's, blah blah blah. I'm sure we all know how it goes. Hello. Do you know you're a virgin? Me, who's not a virgin but have to be nice, so I said, I am? Yes. I'm a virgin. You're a virgin. We're all virgins. I was getting curious now. Okay. How do you know all of this? The people told me. They're all around us and they know we're virgins. Oh well, that's good that you told me. They had a meeting and we're going to the place for the virgins. Oh, that's great, but you've got to order now. Oh, I'll have a tea. She then pulled forward and proceeded to have the exact same conversation with me again at the window, asked for the manager and told her about the new virgin vacation spot as well. It was this old lady and all the makeup she had on was hot pink. I was cast in a play, quit, and then blackmailed and coming back and doing the show by the crazy choreographer. I found out years later the director had no clue and he apologized to me. The night I came in for my first forced rehearsal, I saw a drunk guy get hit and killed by a car outside the rehearsal space. I was a small child in a stroller. My mum was rushing down the stairs and was too slow and the doors in the front carriage closed in her face and she missed the train. A few minutes later, the train crashed. 43 people died and most of them were from the front couple of carriages. Google the Moorgate tube crash if you want to be traumatized. What's your most insane meeting the parents story? He brought his mother on our first date. Dated a girl just for a bit, uh, no plans at all to meet her parents at this point. We had just finished doing the deed for the first time when she got a call from her mum. Apparently, she had had a little bit too much to drink and needed a sober ride home. This girl asked if I minded, and I didn't, so we headed to the bar to get them. They were kind enough to be outside waiting for us when we got there. The parents were both leaning back on a railing above some concrete steps, leading to an outside basement entrance. This girl waves at them, and they wave back. Her dad lost his balance and went backwards over the railing. Her mum looked over and just started wailing. Made her stay in the car and call 911 while I went to see what happened. He had landed just right on the corner of one of the stairs and split his skull wide open, dead before I ever said a word to him. That relationship didn't last very long. Oh, I have a good one. My husband and I are older, like in our 40s, and have been dating about a year before I met his parents for the first time. They live on the other side of the country and flew out to visit him. His ex-girlfriend found out and showed up at the restaurant, sat down and dominated the conversation with all of the memories she had with the parents and my husband. It was awkward as heck. They can't stand her but are polite people, and this chick is such a hot mess. I was invited to a former boyfriend's house for dinner to meet his parents. When I got there, his father wasn't home yet from work, so we decided to go for a walk. 
Boyfriend's mother told us to be back at the house by five, so we were playfully racing each other back so as to make it in time. I got to the door a few paces ahead of him, opened the door and found myself face to face with his dad, who was standing completely undressed in front of the door. I turned around and hid around the corner, and the father kind of yelped and ran down the hall, and we were both mortified. Turns out he came home and was getting ready to shower when the phone rang, so he answered it in the buck since he hadn't expected us back yet. In short, I saw his dad au naturel before I even saw him. Well, at least you could try and get a gauge on the family genes and what you might have to work with on your boyfriend later, so it's not all bad, right? I met my ex's mum when I was 15. They were a highly Catholic family and he wasn't allowed to date, so I would go over after school until it was about time for them to get home. So we were making out and my shirt and bra come off, which was pretty escalated for us. Then we heard a car door slam, he grabs my shirt and bra, hands them to me and tells me to go hide in his closet. So I do, shirtless. His mum and him talk for what seems like forever just outside the door. She tells him she's going to go take a nap, so to be quiet. After she went into her room, he came and got me. Right as I'm trying to get my bra on, she steps out of her room and sees me. We broke up soon afterwards. In short, got caught by a super Catholic mum shirtless in her son's closet. Not so much of a story, but just before I met his mum, my ex said to me, My mum is like a shark. She can smell fear, so you know, just like, don't be scared. Oh, okay. My ex-mum surprised him with a visit while we were mid-whoopee. My clothes somehow ended up all over the apartment, so I had to come out and greet her, wearing nothing but his shirt and pretending it was a dress. She knew. Did I mention she was one of my bosses? Met the father at the boyfriend's hockey game. He was sweet and bought me a hot chocolate and himself a coffee. About five minutes later, he gets booted from the arena for arguing with a ref and throwing his coffee at said referee's face. (sighs) <sighs> His mum asked us if we were, quote, dipping winkies, <laughs> please bear in mind that I'm a female, and said if he ever needed protection for us to tell her we're hungry for hardies, and she'd know what we meant and wouldn't have to explain further, and that she would either give us money or go out and buy us protection. I was 14 at the time. I found out years later that she became pregnant and had a termination at 13, and she didn't want us to have to make that decision, so she was really just trying to be helpful. But it was a little much for the very first time meeting her. Sitting at dinner with the girlfriend and her parents, I'd just met them 10 minutes earlier, having casual conversations when I snorted. I tried to play it cool, but we all knew what happened. The worst part was about 30 seconds after the sneeze, after everyone had moved on, when the smell crept in. Meeting my now fiancé's mum for the first time, a few months after we'd started dating. She makes a comment about us making babies, half-jokingly, and I nervously reply, It's okay, we're enjoying practicing for now. My ex-boyfriend wanted me to meet his parents, and he told me they wanted to meet me too. We decided to drive up to their place in the Bay Area. We lived in Orange County at the time, We did this for Thanksgiving. I'm white, and he and thus his parents are Chinese. I normally wouldn't mention this, but apparently my whiteness made them not approve of me, and therefore not actually want to meet me. I didn't know they didn't want to meet me, otherwise I wouldn't have driven six hours and showed up at their house. When we knocked on their door, his mother answered, looked at me, and said in Cantonese, I told you not to bring the white girl here. More was said in Cantonese, and I understood none of it. To save money, his parents didn't have the boiler on, nor did they have heat in the house. Not having a boiler meant not having hot water and therefore not having showers. To remedy this, they had a membership at 24 Hour Fitness, where they went every night to have a shower. They insisted that we go to the 24 Hour Fitness for a shower literally 15 minutes after showing up at their house. 24 Hour Fitness has communal showering. I'm absolutely terrified of communal showering. I had to get undressed with my boyfriend's mother 15 minutes after meeting her. At that point, she had never spoken a word to me in English. The first actual communication she showed to me was to thrust a hairdryer in my hands. Anyway, the next few days were excruciatingly uncomfortable. Next to nothing was said in English at all, and I felt like everyone hated me. I spent several days just being as quiet, submissive, and polite as possible. I was sent to his mother's garden to pull weeds in the sun for a few hours, and after that, she apparently began liking me. 
Later in the week, she decided I needed a checkup at the doctor, for what reason I don't know. Turns out she scheduled me for an exam of my lady parts, conducted by a man. A man who I don't know. A man who spoke in really broken English. I explained to her that I was not comfortable with any of this. It was horrible and embarrassing. In short, I got undressed with my boyfriend's mum 15 minutes after meeting her. She hated me, and later she scheduled me for a fricking pelvic exam and didn't bother explaining to me what was happening until we were there. And no, I didn't have that exam. I noped right out of there. Ouch. Yeah, I don't care how great that partner is. I think if that's happened, it's breakup time, right? There'd have to be a bombshell supermodel millionaire to make family meetings like that worthwhile. I met his mum and said, Oh, this must be your grandmother. See, this is why we always guess one generation down. Then it's either flattering or correct. Her parents had an RV and were on vacation when we met. When they returned home, we were doing the deed in the shower. Her mum didn't expect anyone to be at the house with her and just walked in. We had done it everywhere in the house, and she was expecting them home the next day. Her dad introduced me to his 357 and told me to get the F out of his house. So I left. Brit here. Do American fathers actually shoot their daughter's boyfriends, or is it more of a statement? It's a stereotype. Sometimes true, and oftentimes not. My worst meet-the-parents situation was several years ago. I walked into his house and noticed framed photos on the wall. All of them were stills from when they were on the show Wife Swap. That in and of itself was no big deal until I saw the episode, but then father approached me and I stuck out my hand to shake, and he just looks me up and down, turns to his son and says, Is she a subscriber to The Way? And later on we were all having dinner, and his sister is telling the parents how she heard I was a working girl and they attempted to evangelize me. I went to pick her up and her mother was a parole officer. She photocopied my driver's license and made me wait around while she phoned somebody at the station to check my record. I was 16 and it was the winter formal. Her dad waved from across the room and I happened to be walking towards him and landed the most awkward high five of my life. I dated a Korean guy for a month or so in high school. I went to his house after school one day and encountered his dad on the sidewalk before he made it there. He looks at me, looks at his son, and begins pointing at me and yelling at him in Korean. I had to awkwardly stand there for about five minutes of them going back and forth before we parted ways and I just went home. Turns out he didn't want him dating a non-Korean. That's actually pretty common occurrence for the people who recently migrated from Korea. The grandparents will pretty much ignore their grandchildren if something like that happens. Dating a Japanese person is the worst, though. Current boyfriend has extremely Christian and somewhat square parents. They're very sweet, albeit sheltered. So he and I have a running joke that he uses me for nothing more than as a splooge bucket. So he texts and tells me he's at his parents' house. Unbeknownst to me, he hands his iPhone to his mum to look up a brownie recipe, and at that exact moment, I text him back, tell your parents your splooge bucket says hello, which of course popped up. She purportedly shrieks, and he now has a cracked screen. You can submit your own stories to be featured here on the channel. The story submission link is in the description below. And if you want to listen to some vibey music in the background, check out Easy Mode, also linked below, and subscribe. I knocked up my girlfriend. She is Vietnamese. Talking to her mum on the phone, she somehow let it slip that she was Praganonant. We had to cancel all plans immediately, drive over an hour to where they are, near the older brother's house, and discuss this with them. So picture the scene. Me, a giant white guy, and them, a tiny Asian family. The scene is a kitchen table with her mum, dad, sister, brother-in-law, and the girlfriend and I. There was about an hour of unbelievably awkward discussion and arguments in Vietnamese with me just sitting there. Everything turned out alright as our boy is two months old, today actually, and her parents and family love me. It was like meet the Fockers, mixed with Knocked Up and Apocalypse Now. I met my wife online back in 1995 when I was 23 and she was a 19-year-old college student. She lived nine hours away and I had no car, so when it was my turn to visit her, I got a cheap plane ticket. She came to pick me up at the airport around midnight, but parked her car in the wrong place. We returned to her spot to find that the car had been towed away. We took a cab to the impoundment lot and discovered that they wouldn't release the car to us, because her parents owned the car. 
My poor long-distance girlfriend had to call her parents around 1am and ask them to drive to the impound lot, which was an hour away from their house, to get her car out so the two of us could drive back to her apartment for illicit unmarried relations. When her parents arrived, I introduced myself to her dad, shook his hand, and said, I'm sorry we couldn't have met under better circumstances, and he just grunted at me. Well, author, you married them in the end. I figure he might have got over it in the 16 years between the incident and you writing that story in 2011. If he still bears a grudge now in 2024, then I really admire your commitment to her. At least now your relations are post-marital. I met my wife, then girlfriend's parents, once or twice before Christmas. However, I didn't really get the chance to meet the rest of her family or really them for that matter. So when my girlfriend asked me to come over for the holidays, I thought it would be fun. Okay, something quick you have to know. My family doesn't celebrate holidays. I mean, we used to, but after a while, we just got lazy. So while we might go somewhere nice to eat on Christmas, we don't exchange gifts. And for some idiot reason, I didn't consider buying her family anything until I was an hour away from her house. Crap. So I quickly get some gifts from a shop that is surprisingly open. However, this place was just a step above a gas station. The mum got an ugly Christmas pillow and the dad got a collection of shot glasses. I gift wrap in the car and drive the rest of the way, not even realizing I forgot to get something for her brother. So I get there, put the gifts under the tree, I notice eight gifts for me, and I try to play it cool. I seem to be making a good impression and by the night time, I think I'm golden. I go to sleep with dreams of sugar plums and fairies. And frick, I'm sick. Abort. I wake up on Christmas morning, projectile vomiting, all over this family quilt thing that they've put over me, and I run to the bathroom, chucking up all along the way. Lucky for me, no one woke up. I do my best to clean everything and go to bed for another hour. I wake up to Santa going round two to my stomach. I sit up and chuck up again. My girlfriend runs in, sees me, and helps clean me up. I make her swear she won't tell anyone. I get up, take a shower, and by the time I'm out, Christmas breakfast is beginning. I make it through the breakfast, but as we sit down at the tree to open presents, I lose it again. I have never chucked up that sloppily in my entire life. I was like a freaking sprinkler during summer. Her mum screamed and jumped back, only to hit the couch wrong and topple over it. I run for the bathroom, and there I am for 15 minutes. When I get back, I'm ashamed. The family cleaned up my chuck and tell me it's okay and that I should lay down. So I do. Christmas dinner is around the time I wake up. I'm sweating and shivering, and I barely remember I'm supposed to meet my girlfriend's grandparents tonight. They'd driven five hours to meet me. I stand up, get dizzy, and somehow end up on the floor again, where I decided to close my eyes for a few more minutes. And I crap myself. I'm not kidding. One minute I'm sort of zoning, and the next I feel this intense stomach cramp. Then I just do it. I crap myself. I lay there in my own number two for a minute as I hear the family outside laughing and spreading the cheer. They are loving the holidays and the togetherness, and I, on the other hand, am hating everything about this crappy situation. I text my girlfriend because that's all I can do. I say, I had an accident, come in here. She comes and asks where the puke is, and I just close my eyes, take a breath, and mutter, I crapped my pants. So my girlfriend helps me out of my pants and gets me some wipes, and I'm so freaking sick that I'm not even wiping correctly. And the entire time, my girlfriend is in and out of the room, throwing stuff away and grabbing more stuff. I hear her grandparents and parents talking about what's going on. At one point, I hear a knock on the door, and it's her mum. She wants to check on me, and the girlfriend screams, Do not come in! Which, of course, is the reason she comes in. So my girlfriend and her mother are in the room with a very sick me, trying their best to ignore the smell. Then I hear the fire alarm. The mum had forgotten to take something out of the oven because she was trying to help me. The good news is nothing was burned, but it's fun to add to the story. By the time the Christmas ham is being served, I'm back in bed, muttering my apologies. The next morning I wake up, and this is the worst part, I wake up feeling okay. So I thank everyone for the lovely time, say I have a work emergency, and bolt. Just freaking bolt. God, I hate Christmas. Wow, that sounds like a crap Christmas, pun intended. And again, you stuck around with this person after the incident, so one hopes that things with the in-laws are better now. I mean, they seemed very sweet and understanding. I'm sure it's come up many, many times since then, though.
I was dating this girl for about three months and got her proganinans. We decided it was best if we just got married, as I was 27 and she was 20. I drove to my parents' house to tell them, and at the same time she went to her parents' house to tell them. I offered to go with her, but she said, You don't know my dad. Which was true, because while she had met my parents, I'd never met hers. Sitting at my parents' house listening to them tell me how I was throwing my life away, the phone rings. It was my girlfriend. She said I needed to go over to her parents' house because they wanted to meet me. I showed up at their house and was escorted to the living room where I was asked to sit in a chair in the middle of the room. Her family sat in a semicircle around me and proceeded to grill me for two hours. What were you thinking? You're seven years older than her. Are you some kind of pervert? How do you plan on supporting our daughter and grandchild? On and on. That was 20 years ago. I'm posting this from my in-law's house, sitting next to my 19-year-old daughter. I'm still very much in love with my wife and her family still hates me and sees me as the dirty old man that took their daughter away from them. I had to drive her to her mother who was giving birth in hospital. That was when I first met her parents. Bonus points, she named the child the same name as me. The doctor said, it's a boy. And her mum said, I'll call him John. She then turns to her daughter. Who's this with you? Um, mum, meet John. In hindsight, I could have pretended I was her child that had travelled back from the future to witness his own birth. Frick, that would have been weird. Oh, I have a good one. It's not a relationship type meet the parents, but it is the worst experience I've had with someone's parents outside of my dysfunctional family. My friend is the son of one of the physics professors at my university. So when I got introduced to my future instructor, because I decided to major in physics, I was forced to make some small talk. He also prepared a lovely dinner for us too. I had no clue he had three other children in the family, so he started talking about them. We talked a lot about how his oldest was in Germany and his second oldest skipped a grade. That was my friend. I started spacing out and instead focused on the food and how good it was. At this time, he mentioned that his youngest daughter was at Girl Guides. And right when he said that, I let out the most satisfying, mmm, to signify that I was really enjoying his food. I then clued back into the conversation and said, Girl guides, yeah, I like them. Which was a mistake when I quickly realized what I'd just said after mmm. I could see my friend holding back laughter, but I just sat there and ate my food in silence. He gave me this really weird look, and I don't think he's looked at me the same since, even after being my instructor for six upper-level physics classes. We never spoke of it again, but my friend likes to bring it up every so often. In short, I meet my future physics professor over dinner and his first impression of me is that I'm some creep who really enjoys girl guides. She only had her mother and her father passed away when she was young. I go to her house and wait for her to get home and meet her mum. She has a bottle of Dewar's on the table. Her mum was pleasant and not too drunk at the time and she offers me a drink. I normally don't drink the hard stuff, but I decided to be polite and take it. Her mother gets a phone call, and apparently my new girlfriend is going to be about two hours late. The mother sits down next to me on the couch and tells me. Then the unthinkable happens. Her mum, not very attractive by the way, puts her hand on my upper thigh. She says we have two hours if I'm interested, and smiles. Now at the time, I'm only 18, but I had enough common sense to get the frick out real quick. I met up with my girlfriend later on that night, and I don't even bring up what happened, because what good could it do, right? Two days later, my girlfriend shows up at my house and is wide-eyed. Her breath is labored. She ran to my house. She tells me that one of her best friends just told her that he slept with her mum. I ask when that happened and she said two nights ago. So, I made the right choice. When I was 15, I met my then-girlfriend's father as he drove us home from a school dance. I had my arm around her. He asked if my arm was broken. I replied that it was not. He asked me if I wanted it to stay that way, so I removed my arm from around my girlfriend. When did you get a punishment that sounded easy but was actually horrifying? As a kid, when I did do something wrong, I'd have to write a sentence 100 to 500 times as punishment. I remember having to sit in the car at a family reunion at probably 7 years old writing, I am a bad girl. 500 times because I'd taken a granola bar without asking. Writing, I am a bad girl, that many times, repeated for minor infractions, and sentences like, I am a liar and no one likes liars, or I ruined the day for my family, just sticks with you and becomes internalized. I'm 31 now. It's been a good 15 years since I've had to write these, but I still think them about myself. 
bread and water rations. It was there to cause weaponized constipation. 30 days of constant abdominal pain specifically tailored to humiliate is a lot worse than, oh, bland food, boo-hoo. Standing on concrete. The World War II Germans called them Stärbunker. Stalin called them Kishka, but it's all the same idea. A cell so small you're forced to stand because there isn't enough room to sit. Standing barefoot on concrete for days is beyond brutal. It won't kill you, but it will slowly and very painfully cripple you while keeping you awake for days straight. Something I actually did to myself, I needed to cut weight for a wrestling tournament in a drastic way. Because of a mix-up in weight classes, I needed to drop 16 pounds overnight. I told my coaches that wasn't possible, just pull me from the roster. But my head coach pulls me aside and tells me there might be a way and you don't even have to work out. What you do is fill up a bathtub with the hottest water you can stand and add a bag of Epsom salts and some rubbing alcohol to the water. Go into the bathroom with a buddy, stuff towels under the doors so cool air can't get in, and then get in the tub neck deep. After 60 seconds, your body will already be screaming to get out of the water because you're overheating. I stayed in for 45 minutes, adding more hot water every 2-3 to three minutes to ensure the hell never ended. The buddy is there to make sure you don't die. I sweat out 11 pounds in 45 minutes. Afterwards, I chewed some gum that's covered in citric acid that causes salivation, and I spit out the other 5 pounds over about 2 hours. So, the narrator doesn't think this seems possible, but there were many other replies to this story confirming things like this that wrestlers have endured to lose sudden amounts of weight that don't seem medically advisable to me. Teachers who recommend that high school students do this to themselves are possibly endangering their kids, surely. Insane stuff. Peeling salted sunflower seeds with your bare hands. I had the choice between that and getting my butt beaten with a cable when I screwed up big time when I was six years old. I chose the peeling, and I regretted that immensely. It doesn't sound bad at first, but let me tell you, after one hour, you just want to hold your hands in ice water. Your fingertips get sore, sometimes you prick your skin, and the salt dries out your fingernails, and makes them really sensitive. Not to mention that the salt creeps up your nail bed and hurts like all hell, especially if you rip your skin near your fingernails. I never chose that punishment again. Outlawry. To be declared an outlaw. Today, we think of an outlaw as just anybody who breaks the law regularly. Back in the day, though, it was a punishment. If you were declared outlaw, that meant you were literally outside of the law and could claim no protection from it. If someone didn't like you, they could freely beat you, rob you, torture you, or even kill you. When the stories refer to Robin Hood as an outlaw, that's what they're talking about. It's not a romantic, heroic, swashbuckling thing. It's the state of having no claim to any legal protection at all. The king, or whoever he appoints, takes your land, and anyone who wants it can take your stuff, and anyone who doesn't like you can just beat you to death without consequence. They can also put a bounty on your head and have people hunt you to claim it. What do you think would happen if you lost all protection from the law, and anyone who brought your head to the courthouse could claim a year's salary as a reward? Having to play with chickens my grandpa always told me when the neighborhood kid would misbehave, this was like a hundred years ago since then, his parents would lock him into the chicken habitat and put some liquid or meat on his feet. The chickens would peck at his feet and he would have to flee constantly until he was too tired to, and then he would be released. Kneeling on grains of uncooked rice Goat licking. In medieval times, you'd get your feet strapped between two wooden boards and they'd be sprinkled in salt or something similar so that animals, mainly goats, would lick them. Seems like it would tickle at first, but they won't stop licking. Apparently, they'd lick the flesh off until they hit bones. Having been licked by a cat for like a minute or so, I can imagine this is an awful torture. Being forced to keep your arms up all the time. This was a punishment my dad enforced after bare bottom spankings stopped working. To get out of those, I would laugh even though they hurt like heck because I knew he'd get angry and stop. I'd have to stand against a wall with my hands in the air for hours, and if they moved down, the punishment would get longer. My dad told me about a punishment that was given in schools when he was growing up. He was born in 1954 which was when you had to go to the side of the Isle of Desks and squat down into the like the Asian or Russian squat stance and then hold it for the rest of the class. He said it never sounded bad, but after a while, your muscles and knees would lock up and at the end of the class, in order to get out of the position, you had to fall onto your side, 
or back to the floor to let your legs relax enough to allow you to move and use them. He told me when I was super young, but it's always stuck with me because I was so surprised that something so seemingly small would cause so much pain and loss of control. You essentially got insane Charlie horses when you dropped out of the position. You shouldn't be happy with getting away with a crime by pleading insanity. Instead of a time-definite custodial sentence, you get an indefinite custodial sentence in an underfunded and terrifying medical facility. Maybe for the rest of your life. Yay! Tickling. No joke, the Germans used this in World War II as a form of torture in some cases. It doesn't leave a mark, so it's also used in environments like mental facilities where patients may be restrained and staff go on a power trip. Extreme cases can result in incontinence, vomiting, and a loss of consciousness due to the inability to breathe. It's also easier for the torturer to do it for a long time without it wearing away at their conscience because the victim is involuntarily laughing. So it's easy to pretend it's not that bad. Being ignored or ostracized. It might not sound like much, but as humans we need that social contact and leave it too long and it becomes incredibly damaging. I hate being confused for an ostrich as well, but it's very much damaging to my self-esteem as I'm so sensitive about my big pointy nose and my knobbly knees. Jokes aside, yeah, being socially alone is a really underrated grim punishment of life. Listening to the same song on loop, then skipping parts of the song. This was a form of torture used by the CIA, and it's absolutely awful. Closing your hand around a chunk of salt water ice and holding it there. Dubbed the salt and ice challenge, where people would hold onto it for as long as they can stand, it can lead to frostbite injuries similar to second and third degree burns. It also essentially fuses to your skin, so if you try to open your hand, it will rip off your skin. You need to use warm water to detach it. I did this about 20 years ago before it was a thing on social media. It sucks. With the attention this is getting, I feel obligated to say definitely do not try this. Isolation. There's a reason solitary confinement is considered a form of torture. The human mind isn't designed to function in an environment devoid of stimulation or social interaction. It was cool going to Alcatraz and doing the audio tour, actually. You get to go into one of the solitary confinement cells with the doors closed behind you, and it's pitch black, and while you're in there, you hear stories from inmates, dramatically read, about what it was like and how some of them would focus their mind until they could see a tiny speck, and within that they could conjure an imaginary television screen and see moving images. It helped them to stop going crazy. Standing at parade rest without being able to talk for five hours. In basic training, someone got caught stealing food from the DFAC no more than 20 minutes after we'd been yelled at for people doing that. As a punishment, we stood at parade rest from 5pm to 10pm without being able to talk and with at least one DS watching us at all times. I don't know how to describe it, but your brain can only come up with so much to do for five hours while not moving. Oh, we had a guy purposefully lock his knees so he'd pass out. Apparently there are clever ways to get out of some of these punishments. I can't remember what country used it, Russia or Japan, I think, but one punishment was genuinely known as the white. You'd be given white clothes, locked in a cell with white walls, with no windows, and a completely white door. You'd get a light bulb on a white fixture, but no light shade. Your bed and its linens would also be white, and you'd be fed exclusively on white rice in a white bowl with white cutlery, and to drink you'd get water in a white cup. After a day or two, you'd begin to hallucinate because of the lack of visual stimulation. Chinese water drop torture. Victims were strapped down so that they couldn't move, and cold or warm water was then dripped slowly to a small area of the body, usually the forehead. The forehead was found to be the most suitable point for this form of torture because of its sensitivity. Prisoners could see each drop coming, and after long durations they were gradually driven frantic as a perceived hollow would form in the center of their foreheads. You're sort of right. They were blindfolded and leaned back. You were also restrained and maybe had earplugs or rags stuffed in your ears. They removed all other senses. They'd also vary the rate of the drops. The torture comes in when you throw off their sense of time. They have no idea when to expect the next drop. You can submit your own stories to be featured here on the channel. The story submission link is in the description below. And if you want to listen to some vibey music in the background, check out Easy Mode, also linked below, and subscribe. Painting rocks. 
A couple of guys in my AIT unit got in trouble, and the sadistic drill sergeant tried being creative with an approved punishment, which was painting rocks. As dumb a punishment as it is, the sadistic side was that this training unit was in southern Arizona during peak summer temperatures. The rocks were literally hot enough to fry an egg on, and both privates' hands ended up being covered with second-degree burns. The drill sergeant faced pretty heavy administrative action. I don't recall exactly what, but it was probably one of the most severe I've ever heard a drill sergeant receive. Waterboarding If any of you kids don't know, there was this big debate back in the early 2000s. Some people were calling it torture, and others were more or less like, it's literally just pouring water on someone's face. What's the big deal? Now, when you put it like that, yeah, what's a big deal? Take someone, make them lay down, and hold them down so they can't move, then pour water on their face. What's the big deal? I remember one conservative radio host got the bright idea to prove live and on the air that it's not as bad as they're saying by having his staff waterboard him on air. And you know what? I respect the guy for doing this. He had a strongly held belief and he was willing to go through it to try and prove his point. He lasted all of 15 seconds before he tapped out of it, hacked and coughed for about 5 seconds, and finally managed to say, definitely torture, before suggesting they take a break so he could recover from that. Good on him for admitting that he was wrong. It gives the narrator a good chuckle to think about the other listeners who presumably were already minds made up that they agreed with his first point of view, and you've got to wonder whether that changed any of their minds. Most people are so entrenched about this sort of thing. When visiting Africa, we learned that some places have their own form of lethal injection for criminals, by snakebite. Committers of the unspeakable act and murderers would be forced to receive a bite on both ankles from a puff adder. After officials verified the bites, they'd be sent home, under supervision, to spend their last days with their family. Some people thought it sounded like a more humane form, but it's not. When I was around 10 years old, being forced to stand in the corner of the living room with my parents and siblings in the room and stare at the wall for hours. Kneeling in salt When I was 16, my mother told me that if I kept my attitude up, I'd be kneeling in salt. Being a dumb kid, I was like, oh, whatever, it's just salt. Well, I kept that attitude up, and my mum sprinkled a light dusting of salt on the tile floor in the kitchen, and I had to kneel in salt for an hour. The grains cut my knees and burned the wounds. I'm 32 now, and I still have scars on my knees. I will add this before the replies come in. I know that this was not good parenting. My mum was pregnant at the time and not in a good place mentally. My sister is now 16 and has never even had as much as a slap. Just recently, my sister told me she thinks I was just a bad kid if mum did all of that to me. I told my mother about the conversation afterwards, and my mother said, You weren't a bad kid. None of you were. I just had a temper and I didn't know how to control it. I'll admit I'm an adult now and with two kids of my own, and hearing her say that made me cry on the way home. I knew in my head I wasn't a bad child. I rarely got into trouble, never did substances. I just had an attitude but I hadn't realized how heavy my heart was from the punishments. I was the first of three kids, I got the worst of it, and I always blamed myself. Even when I was finally over it and rebuilt a relationship with my mum, I blamed myself. I hadn't realized how much I needed to hear her say that until she did. This was three weeks ago, and I'm tearing up just typing this. My cousin, at ten years old, quite agile, never sits still. Once he troubled my aunt so much that she punished him. His punishment was to sit still on the bed and do nothing. No TV, no playing either on the phone or with his toys, not even speaking. No one was allowed to come to his room so that he can't even watch others. He asked her if he could read his textbooks as he thought studying would lessen her anger, but she denied him even doing that. He had to sit completely still. Initially, that punishment seemed quite simple to me, but what impact it had on this small child was huge. This punishment tortures you by boring you, which a small child can't take. At last, he broke down crying, after which he was pardoned. Okay, I'm stretching the definition of a light punishment here by a long way, but when I heard of death by a thousand cuts, I thought it would be someone giving you a bunch of cuts until you bled out. Painful, a bit extreme, but the reality is actually much worse. It turns out cuts is a bit of a mistranslation, and it should really be slices. The executioner slices big chunks off your body systematically, up to muscles and whole limbs, with the aim of keeping you alive as long as possible. There are a handful of pictures of the process being done, which are just about the most horrific things I've ever seen. It's kind of lost its sting from popular overexposure, 
But crucifixion is one of the most agonizing deaths humankind has ever come up with. Just the muscle cramps alone from staying in one position for hours is enough to put it in the running, and the constant near strangulation competing with the pain from the nails is probably the main draw. The White Room Punishment Everything white, tasteless, no sound, room temperature kept at body temperature, if I remember correctly, just a bed, toilet, water and food, nothing that could be used in any way to alleviate the boredom. It doesn't seem that big at first, just nothing to do for a while, but it's in truth some of the worst torture one can experience. Famine Walls This was something I'd never heard of until I took a trip to Ireland and saw them firsthand. These were famine walls and they were built during the famine of the 1840s as a means to keep the hungry masses out of the estates of the landowners. We learned it was the usually homeless Catholics who built the walls for a few scraps to eat. According to our guide, massively, largely pointless work projects like the famine walls and the famine roads kept the masses barely alive during the four years that the potato crop failed. The British rule had proclaimed that the poor had to work for sustenance and not be given charity or allowed to beg. Just think about how demoralizing this would be. Day after day, building stone walls with zero purpose just to earn your bread and soup for the day. The shocking thing is the scope of the famine walls. They're literally everywhere on the countryside as far as you can see. It's really insane just how horrifically a lot of Ireland was decimated by the English in the last couple of centuries, and how little of that is present at face value in British schooling on the old empire. They're starting to come to terms with what they did in their more distant colonies, but just how much they mistreated and massacred their western neighbors really doesn't seem to get around much in your average Brit's education from what I've seen. That farm pit punishment they used to use in Eastern Europe, where the criminal is made to stand in a pit on a hog farm for a day, which starts out empty, but then the hog manure pours in with them as the hogs produce it. I'm always shocked by the number of people who consider it better than jail when it's brought up just because it's only a day. That sounds similar to the chicken poop prison in Thailand. You'd end up with severe respiratory illness due to the ammonia. People rarely survived a month, and former inmates were left with chronic lung disease and PTSD. Your mum saying she's not mad at you, just disappointed. My dad is the king of cruel and unusual punishments. He forced me and my brother to drink pint after pint of water without allowing us to use the toilet, made me run up and downstairs when I was nine for hours on end until I confessed to something I didn't do. Doesn't sound bad until you actually do it. My friend once proposed a punishment for people who mistreat animals, sort of as a joke. They'd be locked in a small cell for a few days, which is then pumped full of the heavy smell of dog breath. Apparently, most people, including me, thought that sounded very light for the crime until asked to actually visualize it. When I did, I literally gagged at the thought. Having bamboo shoots grow beneath you while tied down. In my home country, the penalty for the unspeakable act and substance trafficking is whipping, with no limit, a specific number to be set by the judge. First, they clinically clear you for the punishment. Then they get you in a bent-over pose while your butt is visible through a wooden frame. The torturer, a man in a legitimate black hood, shows up and dips a horsewhip in medicine. The medicine serves two purposes. Firstly, it helps with slight healing during the whipping, in order to allow the prisoner more lashes during that sitting. And secondly, because the medicine is sticky, it causes the whip to stick and tear flesh from the butt whenever it cracks. My teenage cousin wanted a government or town summer job where he could work out and work on his tan all day. My uncle was angry at him for thinking all government jobs were cushy, sit on your butt, kind of do nothing things. So for him, he found him a job as a grave digger in a local cemetery. He was in the sun all day and got tons of exercise. Wrapping your fingers tightly with a thinner duct tape or anything string like but with an adhesive for minutes, with the tip of the fingers left out. Restricting any blood flow to the tips of your fingers isn't child's play, provided you're restrained and can't do anything with the pain, stings like heck. Parents should not make their kids eat soap for saying a bad word. It's really horrible for them. Usually, the kids picked up the word from the parents, and even if they didn't, it's needlessly cruel. Silent treatment and stonewalling, especially coming from a loved one. It creates a terrible imbalance in the relationship and serious psychological trauma on the stonewalled individual. No one should ever choose this method to punish the other. 
Buck ragging for kids. Making a kid breathe in buck or male deer urine on a rag. It smells so bad. Everyone I knew as a kid who received it said it was their most feared punishment. Everyone who didn't said it's just a gross rag. How could five minutes of that be bad? Your teacher shaming you in front of all of your classmates for giving a wrong answer. When did someone try a crazy or cringe pickup on you? Let me start my story by stating the fact that I am very, very pregnant. I am so hugely and obviously pregante that people feel the need to approach me in public and offer their condolences for how pregnant I am. I'm not kidding. Men and women alike have stopped me just to say, You poor thing. I'm so sorry. You look miserable. That's how purgent I happen to be at the moment. That being said, my favorite place to be in the entire world is in a pool. Swimming makes me feel like a normal human being. The swelling in my hands and feet goes down, the pressure on my hips vanishes, my belly button goes back to being an innie. It's wonderful. Anyway, last weekend, my friend texts me and asks if I'm up for a swim. I certainly am up for a swim. However, it's a little after 8.30 and my condo's pool closes at 9. We decide to go to the pool at her apartment complex as it's open until 10. We make our way out to the pool where the only occupant is a middle-aged guy wearing a swim cap and goggles. I don't pay him any mind, I just figure it's a resident doing some evening laps. No big deal. He watches us get in the pool and says something I can't make out. I ask him to repeat himself and he just says, I'll swim over there. Um, okay. So my friend and I start chatting about nothing in particular and Mr. Swimcap starts awkwardly butting into our conversation. He wasn't trying to add to it, he would just ask random questions, only we couldn't make out what he was trying to say. So we kind of brushed him off and he started swimming around the pool and keeps accidentally swimming into us. Keep in mind, he's wearing goggles. So we move to another part of the pool and try to act like nothing's happening. He stops trying to swim into us and just starts staring at us. Then he says something, and the conversation goes as follows. Juan Blay 8? I say, what? Juan go date? Dude, I can't understand what you're trying to say. Would you want to go on a date? I pause. Are you talking to me or her? And I motion towards my non pregnant friend. Y- you I think you're really attractive. Do you want a date? Uh, no, I'm very flattered, but no thank you. So you don't want a date? Uh, no, I don't want to go on a date with you. You have a man? Yeah, I I have a man. We're fixing to have a baby. Do you live together? Yes, we do. So you don't want to go on a date? No. Dude, no, I don't want to go on a date with you. But would you? Would I what? Go on a date with me. I think you're a really attractive person. No, I'm done talking to you now. Please leave us alone. I go back to my friend and we start discussing exit strategies as the guy continues to talk to himself. Luckily, my friend's male neighbor decided to come and hang out for a bit, and Mr. Swimcap starts ranting at the neighbor about who knows what. Mortgage companies, maybe. So we try to enjoy the remainder of our time in the pool. A little while later, the security guard comes by to lock up. My friend, her neighbor, and I bolt out of there while Mr. Swimcap is gathering his things. Good guy neighbor walks me to my car to ensure there are no creepers lurking about. Look. There are pregnant women who are single, attractive, and who might be very receptive to going on dates. But it's a real big swing to ask them, and you've got to learn to take no for an answer no matter what you're into. And I do kind of wonder whether this guy was specifically interested in her because she was pegante, or whether he thought literally any woman dating him was a win at that point, and that her standards for some reason might be lower because she was pergonant. In any case, weird messed up dude. Gave a speech for a class once, and after my speech ended, I went to take a leak and get a drink. On the way back to class, a cute Asian girl from the class was in the hall, looking like she was waiting for someone. I assumed her boyfriend, since he was also in the class with us. She saw me and lit up and asked if I wanted to join her for a cig. I don't smoke, but I obliged to keep her company since other people's speeches suck. And we headed outside. We joked around a bit, she tried flirting, but I have a girlfriend and didn't reciprocate. Figured she was just a bubbly person. Right when we were about to head back, she hands me a slip of paper with her number and says, You should give me a call later today, we can get high and get to know each other better. I ask about her boyfriend and she says, He's working later. I of course politely declined, went back to class, and spent the rest of the day wondering why the scenarios straight from the script of an adult movie always happen when I'm in happy, committed relationships but never when I'm single. 
When we got back to class, she gave her boyfriend a peck on the cheek and sat back down next to him. I was walking down the street in the middle of December, hands stuffed in my pea coat, walking behind a young man who looks pretty paranoid. He finally stops and asks, D- Do you have a piece? I pull my hands out of my pocket and shrug. Nope, no weapon. Oh, do you have any green herb? Nope, dude, sorry. Oh, do you have a boyfriend? Priorities, man. Priorities. <laughs> I was walking down a street in Berkeley, often lined with older homeless guys and panhandlers. It was a warm day, so I was wearing a cute but modest black and white polka dot 50s style dress that always got me a lot of attention from the men. Anyways, walking by two older guys, sitting on the sidewalk near each other, but far away enough not to encroach on each other's change-seeking turfs, when the first one I pass, hollers something to the effect of, Hey girl, let me see that dress on my bedroom floor. Ironic, because, well, you know. To which the second homeless guy responds, without missing a beat, Hey, don't you talk to my wife that way. She's a lady. In short, random Berkeley bum defended my honor. I was arrested in high school for a spontaneous bout of stupidity, and as I got into the cop car, I realized that there was a teenager doing a ride-along with the cop. I don't think much of it, seeing as that, you know, I was pretty busy focusing on how much trouble I was going to be in. A few days later, as I settled into my permanent grounding, I got on Facebook. Lo and behold, I have a Facebook message. The boy doing the ride-along with the cop had written down my contact information and found me on Facebook just so that he could send me, Hey girl, I just wanted you to know that I hated arresting a woman as beautiful as you. I was walking down the street with my mother. As it was summertime, I was in shorts and platform sandals, which were in fashion at the time. I walked by two guys and one of them starts telling me he loves me and he wanted to go out with me. My mum asks him if he was crazy, to which he replied, I'm crazy for her. I was nine. I was hanging out with a friend the day before Easter. She had to drop by another friend's house for a quick errand, so I went with her. They had an Easter party going on for this woman's children and a few of her friends. The parents were having a barbecue and the kids had done an Easter egg hunt and moved on to painting pictures for their parents. A normal enough fellow started chatting with me, and after about 10 minutes with the group, I realized he was there with his two-year-old and the baby's mum. I wasn't sure if they were together, but I just assumed they were, and left it at that. So when we went to leave, I was totally taken aback when he pulled me from the doorway where everyone was saying goodbye to each other. He shook my hand and whispered, Shh, it was so great to meet you. Shh. He put his finger to his lips, winked, and then turned me back around to face the group. I just stumbled through my normal goodbyes and left without acknowledging him. While walking away, I unfolded what had slipped me while shaking my hand. It was his number and a note that said, You're cute. Text me. Torn from a large chunk of the Easter painting his child had proudly handed him ten minutes before. In short, father of the year destroys his child's masterpiece to hit on me in broken English, in front of his baby mama. Quality bloke. I wonder if she took him up on his offer. Oh, whoops. Guess she just threw that number into the trash can in the same kitchen that it was handed to her next to. What are the chances? Walking down the main street of a medium-sized town with my girlfriend and her sister. An alright guy in an alright looking car, maybe about 22 to 25, pulls up and shouts to the sister, Hey, you in the blue. Come get in the car. Go with me. They were married four months later. Last I heard, it was still going strong, but that's been a while. I didn't say anything at the time because I thought she knew the guy, and later I was annoyed at her. I'm pretty sure she's messing with you and she knew him somehow. My parents were walking through Target when the stumpy guy walks up to my mum. He says, Sugar zero, sugar zero, sugar zero. Mum laughs and asks him what he means, and the guy goes, If anyone asks, you can tell them that I whispered sweet nothings to you. My dad was laughing too hard to care, In short, mum got told sweet nothings by a gnome. I have very, very long hair. It reaches below my knees. If it helps you visualize, I'm a slim Asian female. Damn, girl, your hair be crazy, like a mother frickin' horse tail. Hey, you should know I'm a total stallion, babe. This guy leans in really close and starts stroking it. I get the frick out of there as fast as possible. He calls after me in a gruff plead, Aw, come on, girl. Let me see if all your hair be that long and beautiful. I briskly walk away, but not before I hear him turn back towards a buddy and swear. He thinks I've got a crazy long bush? I've also just had a guy grab my chest out of nowhere. I punched him on the ear. 
You can submit your own stories to be featured here on the channel. The story submission link is in the description below. And if you want to listen to some vibey music in the background, check out Easy Mode, also linked below, and subscribe. I got a new job teaching computer courses to adult classes of adult learners. I go to check out an apartment I found on Craigslist near my new job. The renter and I exchange some emails. I tell her about my job and she tells me about the nutrition supplement she sells. She also tells me entirely too much about her life, her ex-husband, and her custody battle over her 13-year-old son. Boundary issues. Got it. But I respond very sympathetically towards her because I'm a people pleaser with my own boundary issues. We hit it off. The address is a house and I figure it must be a duplex of some sort. The renter invites me in. She's a 40-something-year-old woman, fairly attractive, and I'm in my early 20s at the time. She introduces me to her son, who's in the living room playing Guitar Hero. Then she shows me the room, which is just off the living room, separated by a curtain. I tell her I'm surprised I thought she'd listed an apartment. No, she explains, it's just the room, but it comes furnished with the dresser and this waterbed. Don't worry about the curtain, she says. You'll have plenty of privacy. You just need to turn this fan on. She turns the fan on. She sits on the bed and asks me if I like waterbeds. I tell her I've never been on one. She invites me onto the bed with her. I demure, she cajoles, and promises me it will be fun. I don't get hit on much. I'm a good-looking guy, but quiet, and I'm just not used to having signals sent my way. But at this point, I put it together that she's inviting me to engage in hanky-panky, while her son is 15 feet away, on the other side of a curtain. I'll admit, I was interested despite my common sense, but common sense did win the day. I get out of there as quickly as possible and tell her I'll have to think about the room situation. Epilogue. The next week, guess who shows up at my level 1 Windows Vista class? And guess who pretended he'd never seen her before in his life? This guy. It seems like you definitely should have gone through with it to avoid that social situation, dear commenter. But in all seriousness, that is an awkward proposition, especially with her offspring in listening distance. I was waiting for the last train from Paris to go back to my good old suburbs. So this is right after midnight. The station was quite empty, only a few people left around. I should probably mention that I'm a girl and alone. Anyway, I have about 15 minutes left to wait, and this old guy just comes and sits next to me. After a few minutes, he gets the courage to ask me, Could I ask you a favor? Sure. Oh, never mind, it's okay. He looked really sad and miserable about something, so I tried to be nice and insist, thinking he's just going to want to talk about something. Um, could I see your feet? Excuse me? I think you have beautiful feet. Could I just see them? I won't touch or anything. I just want to look. You can keep your socks on if you want. At that point, I'm quite weirded out. I was wearing some Converse, and this guy was making me feel bad for telling him I don't want to show him my feet. He kept insisting with this miserable look on his face. He even suggested to get on the next train, and if there's too many people, I don't have to if I'm being shy or something. I actually felt like I had to apologize to him because I didn't want to show him my feet. In short, I apologized to a creeper who wanted to see my feet. As a bonus, on the same night, I got off the train and walking towards my dad's car, waiting for me, another car drops their window and someone mumbles at me, Hey, what's your name? At which I'm too tired to think and mechanically reply like they're asking something from me. Sorry, I don't have a name. I felt embarrassed at the time about being so dumb, but it turns out it's a quite funny way to get rid of weirdos. So I witnessed this at a bar one night. This was at a college bar in California. Anyways, this young couple were sitting at the table next to mine and it was apparent they were dating, holding hands, smiling at each other constantly, among other things, and were minding their own business when out of nowhere, a guy in his early 20s and clearly a bit drunk walks up to their table and looks at the girl for a second, then glances at the guy and says, Hey guy, mind if I talk to your sister? Well, hearing this, I look over at the boyfriend and he has this look on his face that just screams, What the frick? So here's how the rest of the conversation goes. Boyfriend says, She's my girlfriend, man, so yeah, I mind. You're dating your sister? Isn't that illegal? No, she's not my sister, she's my girlfriend. Oh, so she was your sister and now she's your girlfriend. No, leave us alone, kid. At this point, the drunk guy turns around and yells for his friend to come over. Hey, come over here, this guy's dating his sister. So the next thing I know, this well-groomed and dressed guy, clearly gay, 
comes over to the table to see what kind of trouble his buddy is getting into. He's dating his frickin' sister. Isn't that illegal? That's what I said. Well, now the couple are pretty annoyed and the girl suggests to her boyfriend that they go somewhere else. As they gather their things and start to walk away, the second guy walks up to the girl and says, Hey, would you mind if I talk to your brother? And this look of horror spreads across her face as she realizes the gay guy wants to talk to her man. They basically ran out of the bar and the two guys busted up laughing from the reaction they got. In short, mind if I talk to your sister? I'm trying to figure out which one was the wingman. I was in the back seat of my friend's truck with a girl I just met riding home one day. I make small talk, maybe two minutes of pleasantries are exchanged. Throughout the ordeal, I'm totally enthusiastic and just the embodiment of suave. I ask her, do you have a boyfriend? No. Do you want one? (laughs) Oh, you're serious. Yeah, babe. Sure. I'll never be that cool again. Keep in mind, I'm normally fairly shy around new people. In short, I felt like Fabio. I think this might be one of the rare instances the narrator has read about where that level of boldness, in the company of other friends no less, has actually worked out for the better and not in a humiliating rejection. Then again, the rejection stories are the ones that are generally the juiciest, according to your comments, you disaster-craving weirdos. No judgement, they're more fun for me to read too. My mum was working at her pharmacy job at the pickup counter when a man came up to her and gave her a pickup line something along the lines of Hey, I'm not here to pick up medicine. I'm here to pick you up. That man is my father. There used to be this veteran who went to my college and always wore his uniform, and he used to hit on me in the creepiest ways until I reported his butt. It started off just as friendly banter every once in a while, until one night he has me cornered alone in the bus shelter. I bet you taste good, little princess, like cotton candy. I walked down to the next bus stop. I was riding my bike and got hit by a car. The guy stopped and we exchanged information. I got a call later and it's him asking me if I was alright, which I thought was normal and nice of him, but then he follows it up with, if I'd want to get lunch with him. He then proceeded to call me every day, leaving messages like, you wanna get lunch? I'm really hungry. You don't break a person's tailbone and then ask them out. When I'm drunk, I always seem to want to hit on lesbians. I always have a very good time too, and I've gotten a few numbers, but it's not like I was trying to convert them or something, so I always wake up the next morning wondering what the frick I was trying to pull. I made a few good friends that way though. (laughs) My girlfriend and I were walking along the beach in San Diego last year. An older gentleman, probably late 50s or so, came up to me and said, Son, if I had your body and my money, I'd be unstoppable. How about we put the two of them together? My girlfriend just about fell over laughing while I tried to politely decline. As we walked away, he let me know, you're even more fine watching from behind. I still haven't lived that one down. I was walking back to my car one night and a group of young guys were hanging out on the sidewalk, taking up most of the width of it. My friend and I had to walk through their group. As we walked through, a guy stepped in really close to me and whispered, Girl, I'll buy you Starbucks every night. I had no idea how to respond, so I just smiled and kept walking. But later, I had to wonder, do non-white men think that the way to a preppy-ish looking white woman's heart is the promise of Starbucks runs? Because, well, well, he's kind of right, I guess. This isn't mine, as I've never been hit on, but when I was going to college, I was sitting in the cafeteria with a group of about 11 people who all knew each other and were D&D nerds together. There were four very attractive girls in this group. One kind of sweat-smelling, mouth-breathing, newish guy who'd only recently joined our little group leans over to one of the girls in the group and brags about how he can do a perfect Zap Brannigan impersonation. She asks to see and he goes, If I said you had a beautiful body, would you take your pants off and dance around a little? In Zap's voice. We laugh in that awkward, not sure if he's an unspeakable act offender, way, and I have to leave for class. The next day, he gets to the table before the girl from earlier does, strikes a heroic pose and says, Kipf, I've made it with a woman. Inform the men. The girl is mortified that he not only told everyone, but told everyone in Zap Brannigan's voice. Fortunately, he had the good sense to be too embarrassed to show his face again after that. In short, Zap Brannigan's pickup lines apparently work. I was at a beach with three other friends. It was a weekday, so there wasn't a crowd, 
but a bearable amount of people to handle. We were enjoying ourselves, and my friend and I were just floating about and talking, when I then noticed this tan guy not too far away from us. He was staring straight at us with an extremely creepy, perverted grin. We decided to swim back to shore and started to take pictures, and guess who decides to come along? Creepy tanned guy. At this point, we still haven't really reacted, but then he starts running back and forth on the beach, never taking his eyes away from me and my group. He eventually starts doing his little running routine closer and closer to us. When we thought it couldn't get weirder than that, it did. Every time he ran towards us, he slowed down, eyed us up and down, then smiled his creepy smile and began chanting. He was chanting actual gibberish. No English words or any language you would recognize. It was like he was performing a frickin' ritual on us. It was creepy as heck. In short, creepy dark tan guy tried to hit on me and my friends using some mystic ritual at the beach. What is the most messed up bombshell someone has dropped into a casual conversation with you? One year at the cottage, we met a family who was renting a cottage across the bay for the weekend, which consisted of a mum, dad, a 25-ish year old sister, and a younger sister who was maybe around 7 or 8. One afternoon, the parents decided to tell my mum that the older sister is actually the younger sister's mother, but they're raising her to believe that they are her biological parents. I can't imagine this stayed secret for much longer, seeing as they'd told my mum after speaking to her for maybe about half an hour. We were visiting my mother's house and sitting down for a family dinner once with my siblings and significant others, about eight of us in total. My brother, who's significantly younger than I am, was about 14 at the time. There was a silent moment, the kind where you can hear the sound of chewing and my mother obviously wasn't comfortable with it, so she casually mentioned, I walked in on him tickling his pickle last week. Chaos ensued. I had a female friend over and there were about three of us sitting around on the couch drinking some beers. Then she drops the, so I lost a baby on Sunday, bomb. Yeah, I didn't even know I was pregnant. Anyone want another beer? I have an old friend who tends to drop these kinds of bombshells. She's had a hard life and hates to whine about it, but deep down she really needs to talk about these things sometimes. I think it's her way of keeping us updated about her life without feeling like she's a complainer. She's utterly not a complainer, which we tell her as much as possible, but she went through a lot of rough treatment as a kid and is still dealing with a lot of it. When we were talking about one of my mum's uncles, she casually dropped the fact that he was a serial committer of the unspeakable acts of the worst kind. Jaws were dropped. Hung over at my college's cafeteria, eating breakfast and making obligatory small talk with a girl from Iowa. Somehow, the topic of Crystal, the substance from Breaking Bad, came up. I know, right? What could go wrong with this topic? So I'm saying, yeah, it's a pretty rampant problem. I read a book about it that focused on a city in Iowa, actually. People just boost these big tanks of anhydrous ammonia from farmers. She says, oh yeah, my dad used to be a sheriff in Iowa. Oh, cool. Yeah, one time he tried to close the lid on a huge anhydrous ammonia tank that was leaking. Oh, wow. But he fell in when he was crossing the ladder. Oh, with about a five-second pause after that, before... Is he all right? No, the acid ate him to the bone. He's dead. Oh, well, prick. Another pause, and then I resumed my cereal. Yeah, I mean, what do you even say to continue that conversation? I think there's a much younger version of me that would be fascinated by the state of the body, but now that is not what I want to hear over breakfast. Or at all, really. My gosh. I used to work at a restaurant, and one day during pre-shift, we were casually talking and someone mentions choking someone else as a joking threat. My very hot manager says, I like to be choked. Realizing what she said, she then stayed in her office for most of the day. I picked up a homeless guy on the interstate on the way back from Canvas City to St. Louis. He seemed really nice and had a lot of words of wisdom. He gave me some interesting insight on women and how to stay positive during the rough times. Later, he asked me if I lived in downtown St. Louis. Uh, No, I live in Clayton. I can drop you off around there or somewhere before. He responds, Just don't drop me off downtown with all the N-words. And then, I swear on my life, he pulled out a big knife and showed me how he would stab an N-word if I dropped him off down there. At the next gas station, he went inside to take a leak and I pretended to start filling up the car. 
Once he was out of sight, I popped the trunk, threw out both of his duffel bags on the ground, and peeled out of there. The whole escape probably took less than eight seconds. One night I was talking to a friend of mine that I've known for years, and he drops the biggest what-the-frick bomb that I've ever heard. He told me that when he was 16, one morning he woke up and didn't remember anything. And by anything, I mean he wasn't even able to recognize his parents or girlfriend. The most shocking thing is that he never recovered the memory. He actually doesn't remember anything that happened to him before he was 16. I proceeded to talk with him for hours, asking questions like how it was to wake up one day and have a brand new life. It was messed up and extremely interesting as a conversation. He remembered all school notions, but forgot every person, every personal experience, and even how his own city looked like. He had to study a map of the city to get oriented to go around in places. I was at my friend's house on the last day of winter break, helping him pack his college stuff to go back to school. His mum walked through the doorway and looked at the piles of books, computer stuff, among other things, and had this expression of, what the frick are you doing? And after this long, awkward stare, she goes, Oh, I guess no one told you. Your dad lost his job and you're not going back to college this semester. I was once having a drunken patio conversation with some buddies and we were discussing stupid and annoying things. It was a random conversation about dumb crap and we were having a laugh until one of my friends busts this out. Don't you guys hate it when you're taking a crap and it grazes the back of your ball bag? Everyone else had a long moment of silence. Another friend, after the moment of silence, Dude, how big is your ball bag? I recently caught up with someone I knew from my high school days and we were catching up for dinner. After a few drinks, we get to talking about her husband. And that's when she drops the what the frick bomb. Yeah, it's been hard for him and I, but once he gets out of jail, things will be better. Uh, jail? You never mentioned that. Uh, what, what's he in for? Well, remember how I said he cheated on me once? Well, that's why he's in jail. I stared at her. He got a down-under kiss from a guy with Down syndrome, which is considered illegal in his state, because the guy was not considered mentally an adult. I started mentally planning an escape route. I was hitchhiking and was picked up by a guy who had just caught his adopted eight-year-old son trying on his adopted infant son's diapers. He didn't know what to do or say, so he got in his van and just started driving. He had picked me up simply because he needed to tell someone. I mean, this isn't so bad. Kids do weird stuff. I'm sure the older one was just curious. Doing the deed with some girl out of pity, as she was going through AA. She casually mentions she'd think it were hot if I were to cut off her head and screw it. I really try hard to dismiss this and laugh it off. Then she goes, No, I'm serious. I've done it with a dead body before. This guy I was riding OD'd on smack and I just kept going. It was really hot. I was at a jack-in-the-box drive through and the man and woman in the car in front of me were yelling at each other quite loudly, so I'd begun to eavesdrop. When he got up front to order, it went something like this. I need a number four combo, a number three combo, and a mother fricking divorce, and a strawberry milkshake. She started yelling and I started laughing. I swear that if the clerk didn't ask if that dad wanted fries with that, he or she will be kicking themselves on their deathbed for the missed opportunity. I was driving along with my dad when I was about six, in 1982. We were chatting about civil rights because one of my classmates was the very first black student at my elementary school. My dad was telling me about how the South is very racist, but most of the world isn't like Pennsylvania where he's from. He tells me about his friend in the service in Biloxi, LA, and how they were such good friends, did everything together, even went to ladies of the night together. But in Biloxi, the local lady wouldn't see his friend because he was black, so dad said, you're too ignorant even for a working girl, and refused to see her as well. So this whole time, I was just sitting, listening quietly, being a six-year-old girl with two little blonde braids and a missing tooth. And dad slowly turns and looks at me, and I said, a working girl? And dad said, well, I was in the military, and that's just what you do in the military. On my first day of work at a shoe store, the manager walked around and introduced me to the other employees that came in that day. That was maybe about two other people. The last one of the night was an old, short woman named Joanne. As soon as she sees the manager, she walks up to her and tells us that her husband has found her toys and tried to throw them out. My manager says to me, um, Joanne collects Barbie dolls. And Joanne looks at her and says, no, my other toys. 
giving a co-worker and her boyfriend a ride home and she starts screaming at me to take a different exit off the highway because there's a police car on the off-ramp. Turns out they have a restraining order against each other because he was inappropriate with children and she kicked the crap out of him for cheating on her. They both ended up in jail shortly after, him for the 13-year-old and her for stabbing him in the leg. Me and a friend were sitting around working on his Mazda when he mentioned that he only did it in the butt with his girlfriend because she had a cyst the size of a baseball in her hoo-ha and it grossed him out. Total non sequitur. I paused a minute and then just eventually said, Your air cleaner is dirty. As a kid, I was playing along the shore of the Ohio River while visiting Dad's family. I found some neat sticks in the water and started collecting them when my cousin walked up. He was probably about 20 at the time, and he said, I'm pretty sure those are human bones. Turns out, they were. I was playing with a part of a murdered woman's femur. A few years back in college, I was playing Mario Kart Double Dash and drinking beer with a good friend of mine. I said, hey, pass me the (laughs) turtle. He went, here you go, man. Awesome. Take that, (laughs) baby Mario. He then dropped in this gem. Dude. I've got acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Long, shocked silence from me. Yeah. When did you learn about it? A few weeks ago. I've been meaning to tell you for a while now. Um, wow. I'm, I'm not sure what to say. Hey, your hiccups have gone. What? Oh, you mother fricker. You can submit your own stories to be featured here on the channel. The story submission link is in the description below. And if you want to listen to some vibey music in the background, check out Easy Mode, also linked below, and subscribe. My mum said, I want you to go to the shop for me and get this, this, and this. Oh, and by the way, Bluey, our dog, is dead. Don't forget the bread. Cue me bursting into tears. During my first week of the new job, my boss starts telling me and another employee about how he used to date a deaf girl and that the reason they broke up was that he laughed when she screamed while they were doing the deed. Did you ever wonder if your mom gave your dad a down-under kiss just before she kissed you goodnight? Screw you, Uncle Tony. Screw you. I met this pretty cute girl at the beach a couple of summers ago. We started talking and playing volleyball. Everything seemed normal up until the part where they started describing their life. Yeah, well, my boyfriend is in jail right now for stabbing someone, and that reminds me. You want to see my stab scar? She shows me her stab scar and starts to tell me how she dropped out of school as a complete substance user. You know, I kind of feel lonely without my boyfriend, and he doesn't need to know about anything else. I walked out. (laughs) I was at a random hookup. I met through a buddy. She said not long after the hookup, So, how old are you? My buddy said before I could say anything, He's 27. How old are you? I'm 18, but don't worry, I've done the deed with someone who was 34 before. He's 40 now. It was one of the most awkward moments of my life. It was also the last time I let my buddy hook me up with someone. Good fricking lord. Well, that's enough internet for the narrator for one day. Oh, wait a fricking second. He has to finish recording the second half of this script. Why? The things I do for you weirdos. My friend's girlfriend does this on the daily, pretty much. We'll be talking to them about anything at all and she'll interject with One time, my mother bit me. Or When I was six, a strange man came in through my window. I hate graveyards because dead people talk to me. It's kind of hard to salvage a conversation once it's taken that turn. I came home from high school one day and my parents told me that they had all of our family pets put down that day. Five dogs and a cat. None of the animals were sick or hurt. In fact, one of them was only two years old. We had no problem affording their food and there were no legal issues. They just purely didn't want to take care of five 85-pound bull mastiffs anymore. And it was my job to pick up their crap, not my parents. From this experience, I learned that when you cry long enough, your tears become pink from blood caused by the irritation. I told my parents to go F themselves and lived in the basement for over a month. It was furnished. My mum left food for me at the top of the stairs, and somewhat unrelated, this is when I also taught myself how to code in assembly because I needed a distraction. A few months later, we went to a breeder and bought a West Highland White Terrier. He was a good dog, but I was always slightly concerned that they would randomly kill him too. My folks soon got divorced, and when they did, they didn't ask me who I wanted to live with and didn't fight for custody of me, but they did fight like that couple on the War of the Roses over that fricking dog. 
So, at age 17, I moved out of the house. I had a job. I moved into my own apartment in a crappy neighborhood. To this day, I still don't forgive nor understand my parents, even though they passed away a long time ago. I was studying in the Dominican Republic and living in a very rural area. I passed my days sitting around talking to whoever. One day, I was in a town I frequented, and this guy I hadn't seen before starts talking to me. Within five minutes, he tells me this, totally straight-faced. When I was little, I had a goat, and I used to play with the goat. But then I got too old, so I stopped playing with him. One day, I was sitting like this, and he had his knees apart, and the goat got mad that I wouldn't play with him. He charged, hit me between the legs, and took out my family jewels. Now I have none. I sat there, in shock, hoping that my Spanish was poor enough that I misunderstood. Sadly, an hour later, I hear the same story from his aunt, who's giggling while telling the story with the poor guy sitting right there. Not a conversation I was directly involved in, but there's still a high degree of what the frick. I was talking with some friends the other day, and one of them mentioned that while she was at work, her friends there brought up the topic of deepest, darkest secrets. One immediately volunteered the information that every time she goes to the bathroom, she sniffs her undies. Apparently, everyone just gaped awkwardly and the conversation quickly shifted to other topics. Seriously, if a topic like that ever comes up, don't be the first one to share. A girl I met for a blind date, which is already a disaster on so many levels, casually dropped this nugget as I was hurriedly bringing her home. Yeah, so this one time a girl told people that my friend got her pregnant and it was a lie. It ruined the kid's life. So the next time I saw her, I shivved her in the neck. Huh. I accelerated the car slightly faster. My dad left me on the freeway once for several hours and now that I'm grown up, he steals my money and blames me for everything that goes wrong. Yeah, that was about the third or fourth conversation I'd had with that guy. Way to drop dramatic family conversations into a conversation about cinnamon buns, my man. I was catching up with one of my ex-girlfriends who I hadn't seen in years. We parted on good terms, so it was just friends catching up. She was kind of weird in a monkey cheese ninjas pirates kind of way when I knew her, so this came as something of a shock. She went blah 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 and then I had my kids, but that was after I lost my leg. What, you lost a leg? Yeah, we got in a shootout with some white supremacist group and I got hit in the leg. I didn't want to go to the hospital because the last doctor I saw was an N-word and I think he's the reason I lost my eye. So I put it off and it finally got really infected and then those dirty Indian doctors cut it off. Freaking dotheads. Okay, and uh, who was we again? Oh, and she names some other white supremacist group. You know, I can get you in if you want. The racial cleansing is coming, and I'd hate for you to be on the wrong side of the race war. You're smart enough to be an officer, and we need someone good at planning, because the N-words... I just said, ah. So that's how I found out my ex-girlfriend was a one-legged, one-eyed white supremacist that gets into shootouts. Well, call me mindlessly optimistic, but the narrator is mostly just glad that by the sound of that story... Most of those awful humans were too busy killing other white supremacists to devote much of their time to anything else. I was young and thought Red Lobster was an awesome restaurant. I had a bit of extra money just then, which was rare, so I asked this girl out. She was young, hot, in her early 20s or late teens, smoking body. We're sitting in the waiting area for our tables to be ready when this couple comes in with a toddler in a stroller. She smiles at the little boy and he smiles back at her. That's when she says, oh, he's so cute, he looks just like my two-year-old. I'm rolling with this, okay, she has a kid that she didn't mention. We'd talked a couple of times before, but never dated. So that's cool, I'm thinking, I can deal with this. Then she drops the bomb. Turning to me, she says, by the way, did I mention I have five kids? Um, no. No, that didn't come up. Oh, I've got a couple for you. I was working at a grocery store. I was at the customer service desk. My boss was there. She was about 25-ish, maybe 20. We're talking about partying. I told her I like drinking bourbon to get real messed up. She tells me that, oh my god, she got so wasted off Jack one night, she was at a party and was basically blacking out, and she figures she gave just about every guy at the party a down-under kiss. What? I didn't know what to do. Did I hear that correctly? Holy crap. A couple of months later, I got the world's crappiest kiss of the same sort from the same girl. Practice, demonstrably, does not equal perfect. Even the handy was like some kind of sword-in-the-stone misadventure. Just terrible. Another time, I was talking to my roommate, an English guy. 
I was explaining the concept behind Toots and the Maytals' 5446 song. He was a real kind English guy, and as I'm talking, he just sticks his finger into his nose, then that same finger into his mouth. And he sucks the frickin' thing dry better than my boss ever did. Both so different, both so similar, both so surreal. A guy once paid 300 bucks to take a tinkle on me in some alley, said a late 30-something employee of mine. I may as well throw in one more. From the same office, I made the mistake of dating one of the female junior staffers. Our chain of command was entirely separate, so it should have been okay, but such things never work out as planned. Anywho, after flirting a bit at a bar, she asks me if she can spend the night at my place. She's 21, 98 pounds, and cute, so I consent. Get back, start making out. This is the first time we've ever made out, and ten minutes or so in, she says, I was a victim of the unspeakable act. What? I pull away. No, don't pull away. That's the worst thing you can do. I'm just telling you, it happened to me. Thus began a two and a half month relationship from hell. I was at a bachelor party talking to one of the exotic dancers. She says, Sure, I'll do the deed with the groom and even the best man, but after three or four guys, it gets kind of gross, you know? Her and I were on a first date, and upon her seeing a couple with a baby, she said, I really want a baby. After you get married? No, I mean now. I don't need a husband. I just want a baby. The same girl, later that night, after being around some of my friends, told me that I must not like her because I was too nice to her around them. That if I really liked her, I would have put her down and made fun of her in front of them. There were a few too many issues going on there for me. Visiting my dad in Florida, he says to me, I think the internet will be slow for the next hour. I'm downloading a naughty movie. What was the wildest thing to happen to you at your normal, regular job? Whew, mine would most definitely be what happened today at work. I work at Subway and it was pretty much dead at about 8am. There was an older man who came in, about 6 foot 4, 250 pounds, and he looked about 40 or so. He seemed very shady when I first said hi to him. He walked up to the counter and I asked, What can I get you today, sir? And he replied with, I want a bag of money, in the most serious tone. Now, I've had people come in and joke by saying they want a million dollars, and normally, we just laugh about it. So I chuckled a little, but his facial expression didn't change. So I asked again, what can I get you, sir? And then he asked for the money again, with that stern look. At this point, I'm getting extremely nervous because he seemed very serious. Thirty seconds of silence went by that seemed like it took five minutes. He asked again for a bag of money and I said, I'm sorry, but I can't do that, sir. Would you like something to eat? He just stared at me a little longer, never changing his facial expressions. Finally, he decided he wanted a sandwich, but never lost the stern expression on his face. I still don't know whether he was actually being serious about wanting to rob me or if it was all a joke that he never let me know about. It scared the wee-wee out of me nonetheless. In short, a man tried to rob me and I made him a sandwich. I was working in a mall at a burger joint when I looked up and saw a guy coming out of the men's room holding a bloody butcher's knife. The man calmly walked through the food court and out of the mall exit as my manager and I both looked at each other, not believing what we saw. I swear one minute later, as we're trying to call security, 15 cops ran by with guns drawn. Turns out the guy had stabbed someone to death in the bathroom. The cops were there so fast because the same guy had violently attacked someone else the day before and escaped. He was recognized by a witness prior to going into the bathroom. In short, I saw the aftermath of a homicide while flipping burgers in a mall. I used to work in a dementia ward. I've been bitten, peed on, had things thrown at me, and attacked by a guy who was hallucinating. But the scariest thing was when one of the electric fireplaces caught fire and two of the men in the ward just locked their doors. The time between calling 911 and the fireman getting those two out was terrifying. We can only hope that this incident maybe encouraged the ward to perhaps update their doors to ones that couldn't trap the occupants into their own private furnaces during an event like this. But then again, these facilities tend to be underfunded, so who can say? I'm on disability right now due to my scariest work experience. I was a roofer by trade and I'd been working 7 days a week, 10-12 to 12 hour days, for 3 months. Working on a Sunday, I was finishing the last bit of work for a job at the peak of a roof when some kids came by. They asked if they could go inside the home to talk to the homeowner, and I said no very politely. 
They then pleaded to at least take pictures of the heritage home I was working on for their school project. Feeling sorry for them, I said, okay, fine, but no pictures of the construction, just be quick and careful. Right afterwards, they walked right below where I was working to take a picture. This is where all heck broke loose. Just then, my nail gun slipped and started sliding from the peak of the roof towards the kids. It was gaining speed quick and I was shouting for them to run, move, get the frick out of the way, etc. They didn't. They probably didn't even know what was about to drop on them, so I chased it. I fed myself tons of slack on my lifeline, chasing this thing just to grab it as it was about to fall off. I was able to toss the gun in a completely different direction, but with all the momentum I had, there was no stopping me from going over the edge, and so much slack on my lifeline, so there was nothing to keep me from hitting the ground. I fell 15 feet onto a staircase, shattering my left heel when I landed. The kids moved when they saw me in the air, that much I remember afterwards. This was the scariest thing that's happened to me. Many close calls and all sorts of jobs I've had, but in this particular situation, knowing this is going to hurt like heck is almost indescribable. Surgery went well and four months into recovery now. The internet helps with passing the time. I used to work as a production assistant on Dexter. On one fateful afternoon, we were shooting the fight sequence in the garage from episode 3 of season 4, the one where Dexter confronts the vandalizing neighbor. We had a large blackout tent rigged over this person's house to allow us to shoot a day for night, and I was stationed just outside. It was sunny and hot as heck that afternoon, so after a few takes of shouting and fighting, a request came over the radio that Michael Seahall and J.C. McKenzie needed some water. I ran to the craft service truck, grabbed as many water bottles as I could, and booked it back to the house. As I stepped inside the tent from the bright sunlight, my vision went black. There was a lone practical light in the garage, meant to mimic Dexter's flashlight, which hardly provided sufficient illumination for my constricted pupils. I stumbled into the garage, arms full of water, doing my best to locate our actors. Despite the various crew members in the garage moving about, I was able to find JC rather quickly. He was right under the light talking to the director. So far, so good. I handed him a bottle and turned to find Michael. I spun around a couple of times, scanning the room, but no signs of MC Hall. Even as my eyes adjusted and shadows became clear, I couldn't find him. Then out of the corner of my eye, I saw a shadow move. As I turned around, at that perfect moment, the dark passenger emerged. A figure clad in black, wearing a tattered ski mask, rose from the depths of whatever hell he came from and approached me. My spine froze. All the water bottles tumbled to the ground. For a brief moment, I felt the greatest fear I'd ever known. And then I realized it was Michael coming to grab a water. Man, did I look like a fool. He was very nice and apologetic about the whole thing and insisted he wasn't trying to scare me, but merely attempting to stay in character. We shared a good laugh, but seriously, he was wearing a ski mask and he's Dexter. Any man would crack. In short, Dexter Morgan scared me crapless in real life. I used to work with burrowing owls. We'd check nests with a long, flexible camera and a visor over our eyes. Well, one day, I headed into this field, knelt down, put the visor on, checked the nest. It took about 15 minutes. Then I stretch up and take the visor off. About 50 cows are in a circle 360 degrees around me, staring at me with their cold, dead eyes. I have no idea how I didn't feel them walking over. They started to get nervous and excited as I packed up my stuff and parted so I could see one very angry bull at the back of the herd. I did my very best calm speed walk out of there. In short, I hate cows with a fiery passion. I worked at an electronic buyback store. One day a customer bought by a new 20-inch LCD monitor in the box. I made an offer and he was more than willing to sell me his product. We normally check all items to make sure they work before we pay out for them, so I decided I'd open the box and take a look inside. As soon as I open the box, over a hundred cockroaches come crawling out of it and all over my counter. It took me a good couple of seconds to realize what exactly was coming out of the box, but it was both scary and gross. In short, someone opened a box full of cockroaches at my store. The monitor was in the box, and the customer seemed really shocked and embarrassed about the whole thing. Two people who had come in with just kind of walked away from him as soon as it happened. Can you imagine the conversation between the guy's friends? Damn it, Jerry, this is why we never take him anywhere. For Pete's sake, Jerry, can we hang out at least once without you opening a box full of invertebrates? 
Seriously, though, this sounds like it might have closed down the store for a while. Next is a story that stretches our prompt of normal jobs to its limit. This was a volunteer job I had a while back. The giant Pacific octopus had refused food for a few days, so I was told to bring up a variety of stuff and see if I could get him to eat. I went up to his tank, which was in an isolated area, and grabbed some food and waved it around in front of his cave. He immediately shot out, grabbed the thing I was using to feed him, a plastic grabber that you could use to pick up trash, and then wound a couple of arms around my arm. He then latched onto a rock in his tank and yanked me so hard that I was doubled over the tank wall and unable to move. I'd played with octopuses before, and while they often held onto me with a tentacle, they weren't hard to remove, but I could not get this guy to release me. I struggled and managed to get one arm off, but he quickly twisted another around my arm. He was slowly pulling my hand closer to his mouth, which was really freaking me out. I kept shoving food at him, fortunately I'd bought a lot, and curling my hand around away from him as much as I could, but I was terrified that my hand was going to get chomped on with his beak. It wouldn't have killed me, but they are venomous, and octopus bites can be pretty nasty, even from small ones. His beak was pretty big. Eventually, he relaxed enough to where I could lift him out of the water a bit, he still had a couple of arms wrapped around my arm, and he didn't much care for that, so he let go and went back into his cave. It left me with about 55 bruises on my arm from the suckers on his tentacles. In short, Octopus grabbed me. I was worried he'd bite me. I spin a sign on the side of the road advertising ice cream for a local mum and pop store. An undercover cop pulled over a substance dealer right next to me, had him get out of the car, frisked him, and then confiscated a weapon he didn't have a license for. I awkwardly stood there advertising orange swirl ice cream. Did you take advantage? Say, you guys look like you could use some delicious ice cream right now. You can submit your own stories to be featured here on the channel. The story submission link is in the description below. And if you want to listen to some vibey music in the background, check out Easy Mode, also linked below, and subscribe. I work in vet med. One day we had a guy come in with his dog who insisted that his dog's problem, I think it was a minor laceration, was a much more critical thing than those belonging to the five or six animals already waiting to see a vet, and he demanded that he be allowed to budge the queue. When his initial tactics failed, he began shouting at the receptionist. One of the vet techs went up to try and calm him down, and the guy lost it. He started screaming that making him wait in line was illegal because it meant we were denying the animal his medical assistance, and that before calling the cops on us, he'd be back for personal vengeance. He assured us that he'd bring a piece and any other weapons he could lay his hands on. A lot of people were shaken up, so we called the cops, and they promised to keep an eye on the place for the next few days. We hoped that would be the end of it, but we were wrong. He was back the next day in a karate gi, exactly like the ones that little kids wear to competitions, brown belt and all. He stood in the doorway screaming obscenities while going through every cliché karate pose imaginable. The cops were there within two minutes, and that was the last we saw of Karate Man. The weapon threat was terrifying, and the outfit, not so much. In short, man came in demanding to budge the line, threatened to come back in with a loaded weapon. Instead, came back in in a karate outfit and was promptly arrested. When I worked as a waiter, I always remember a chunky steak knife slipping off a plate I was carrying and watching it fall, tip first, landing at the bottom of the stairs a couple of floors below. A split second after someone walked right in front of it. At a shooting range. I hate new shooters. They get so excited about shooting anywhere in the same zip code of the target that they whip around and say, Did you see that? And end up waving their piece at you. It's scary. I used to manage a pizza place, and one Friday around 11.30am, a guy came in, looking no different than any other of the smack or crystal heads in the neighborhood. We asked how his day was and he said fine, and then when he asked what he'd like to order, he said, give me the frickin' money. The cashier said, what? And he repeated, give me the frickin' money. He put his hand inside his jacket and pointed something from the inside. Hindsight tells me it was probably just his hand and not a real piece, but it's not the kind of thing you want to take chances with. The cashier slowly moved to open the drawer and set it on the counter, and the guy grabbed what he could and ran out the door. He only ended up taking about a hundred bucks, basically what the register had started at, since we'd only been open for 30 minutes. It was just a helpless feeling though, being in charge and having a cashier potentially in danger like that. 
I worked at a five-star rated haunted house for a good four years. It was seasonal. My job was to be an evil clown and my role was to spontaneously appear to the groups that were walking through. Many scary things have happened to me. I've been punched, thrown to the floor, scratched and have had people try to rip off my mask. I've seen people wet themselves and blow chunks all over the place. However, my all-time most scariest experience was when someone actually started dying in front of me. A woman walked through, passed out in front of me in the walkway, and after I tried helping her up, she began shaking and was trying to say something that I couldn't make out. The fire alarm is in the hall, so it was my first reaction to pull it. My manager ran right up to me and took over. Her eyes were already rolled to the back of her head by the time the ambulance got there and they were able to save her. The next day, we were told she had had an allergic reaction walking through the body bag room, which is a room full of elastic, and that's what she was allergic to. The body bag room soon turned into the asylum. Okay, if you're a puncher, stay the frick out of haunted houses. At best, you'll just hurt yourself, and at worst, you'll hurt someone else. In the middle, you'll break some expensive equipment. Yeah, you know what? This is true. The narrator has been guilty of victim-blaming the haunted house workers who get socked in these places. Really, why would you go into one of those things if this is the way you react? Do you want to get sued? I was working for a biotech company and an unknown substance spilled on me. I was freaking out for quite a while. It either gives you cancer or turns you into a superhero. Are you feeling lucky? I was thinking I didn't have any scary work experiences as a kid, but you've just reminded me of mine. I was working in a lab and we all had our powdered chemicals in a series of seven-foot-tall cabinets that slid out from the wall. Inside each one was five or six shelves with wire walls, so there were gaps. These held all the chemicals in place. One day I was going to put away one of the chemicals I'd been using and pulled out the unit, and this tiny vial of some chemical falls from the top shelf and smashes all over the place. At this point I'm thinking, frick, this thing must be poisonous if it comes in such a small container. So I tell everyone to clear out of the lab and I go to grab the head scientist. He just calmly tells me to go get my respirator and he'll come with me to check out what the chemical was. So we sweep it up into a bag and look at the chemical name, which was ridiculously long. Go to look it up in the MSDs and it turns out that it's the only chemical other than water that I've ever seen with all zeros for the Health Flammability Reactivity Diamond. I was working construction in the world's biggest oil refinery when there was an explosion maybe 50 yards from me and a big old fiery mushroom cloud shot into the air. We ducked behind some big concrete pipes, since you never expect only one explosion in a refinery, but nothing else happened. I don't consider it my scariest work experience by any means, but this is the one that seems to fit the question the best. Wait, you mean this isn't your scariest? You have more? Do tell. <laughs> I've got so many I've written books about them, but specifically in that oil refinery we oftentimes work up high on the steel frame structures, supporting pipes and whatnot. Our team had a cherry picker on it, which is basically a mobile crane for picking up heavy stuff. We mostly placed stuff like valves and 30 foot long pipes, maybe a foot or two in diameter, and welded them together. Once we had threaded a pipe via the cherry picker, through a complex piping network a couple of stories down from where the tip of the crane boom was situated. The crane held the pipe while we maneuvered it. We were all under that heavy pipe at various times. We finally got it installed and a bit later were walking to the next job on a refinery road with the cherry picker following us. Its boom was compressed as short as it could go and sticking out straight horizontally atop the mobile platform, with its end hook dangling maybe 10 feet behind the crew as we walked. We heard a thud and turned around to see the hook had fallen off the crane's tip, while it was carrying no load at all. If that had happened just a few minutes earlier while it held the pipe, me or others on the crew would surely have been killed, or at least parts of us crushed and permanently crippled or in need of amputation. To me, something like that was scarier than the fiery mushroom cloud. In that same place, invisible clouds of poison gas were a constant risk. There were little stations sprinkled about the place with sensors, sirens, and revolving lights, with signs saying that if the lights and sirens turned on, to run for your lives away from the station. That happened at least once, maybe more times. It's been over 30 years since then, so I'm hazy on the details. Invisible clouds of death are pretty scary, and to me, scarier than that explosion. I was at a client site supervising the installation of some new major 4000 amp 480 volt switch gear. 
There was a manufacturer rep there to help troubleshoot any problems we had during energizing the gear for the first time. So everything went smoothly at first, opened all the feeder breakers, and then closed the main incoming 4000 amp breaker. So far, so good. As we slowly close the smaller feeder breakers one by one, we get to one that trips as soon as we try to close it. It was probably wired wrong. So the rep opens the main breaker to kill the power to gear, he opens the malfunctioning breaker and sticks his hand in there to check the wiring. The guy fricking yelps, jumps back, and his hard hat comes flying off his head. For a half second, I thought I just watched someone die. Turns out the idiot forgot to discharge the control wiring, so he only got a minor shock from a small charged capacitor. As the construction manager, I had to write up the incident and had a very serious conference call with his employer. I think he might have been fired. I worked in a call center for a large US telecommunications company in sales for five years. A woman called in one day, depressed and needing to talk to someone. Her husband had just died, she had lost her only child a year prior, and she said she didn't want to be alive anymore. This lady had it planned out in great detail, which is why I was even more concerned. I highly suggested 911 because they're trained to handle this sort of thing. At the end of the day, she just needed someone to talk to. I ended up talking her out of self-deleting over the phone and giving her a few other resources I knew of. The Prevention Lifeline, NIMI, among a few others. You'd think working for a phone company in sales could get you some odd characters that call in and it makes for an entertaining story, but this particular incident certainly threw me for a loop. Regardless, at the end of the day, I'm glad this woman didn't take her own life. I work at a skate park. A few months ago, we had a guy try to slash, just ride up and nick the coping with his trucks, on the seven-foot quarter pipe that we call the tombstone. His trucks, the metal things that hold wheels to the skateboard deck, caught up, so he kicked out and wound up landing on the end of his board and shooting out. He smacked his head on the quarter pipe hard enough to break the helmet, and laid on the ground unconscious for a few seconds before going into a seizure had to call the ambulance and try to help him out. It took the ambulance 15 minutes to finally arrive. My boss went to visit him at the hospital and the doctor said if he hadn't been wearing his helmet, he'd be dead. So kids, that is why I'm the jerk about the helmet rule. In short, wear your damn helmet. When you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell to turn on notifications. Put the playlist on in the background to finish listening to all the stories, or if you want some vibey music to put on in the background, check out Easy Mode. If you like Am I the Genius, give Am I the Jerk a shot. Everything linked in the description.